Okay, so this morning we talked a lot about uh, global climate change and then a lot of people were asking, okay, what does that mean for Nigeria? Um, we also talked a lot about the importance of the local level. No, our farmers are at the local level. A lot of investments take place from the local government. So how can we work together with the local government, national level in, in terms of coherence building, et cetera? Now, the NPS, as we have discussed this morning, is a lot about these issues. It's about national level development. It's about coherence between national level and subnational level. It's a lot about, remember the triangle, and I'm sure it will be pulled up in a second. Um, so the first objective was coherence. It's also a lot about um, integrating policy tools. And I had some fascinating discussions over lunch um, about the role of think tanks and researchers here in Nigeria. Um, as in many other countries, the big challenge sometimes is there is a science policy gap. That means um, policymakers not always listen to, to science-based advice. How can we bridge this divide? How can we also engage more with local research institutions for capacity building? And again, in a, in a cross-country spirit. Uh, what can a Nigerian think tank learn from a Kenyan, Egyptian think tank? Um, how can we build a network, et cetera? Uh, next slide, please. So we are now at the integrating policy tool and then remember responding to crisis. And I know there were a, bit, a few hiccups in Kwa's presentation this morning, but that was an excellent example of where the national policies and strategies initiative together with the foresight initiative and, and, and others have really worked on an assessment. What does this global crisis mean uh, for Nigeria? And so this is the kind of work that we are envisaging going forward. Now, this is all a bit abstract, no? So let me give you a few examples what we have already done. We've always only been working for two months or so, but I just want to give you a flavor of what has been done um, in, in other countries. And then Kwa will tell you a bit more later on about our plans for Nigeria. So next slide, please. Okay, so this was our global inception meeting, which took place in uh, Nairobi, uh, Kenya. And, uh, and a bit like here, we put a lot of emphasis in involving local stakeholders, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Agriculture, local think tanks, private sector, international partners, um, and also other one CGIR initiatives, so that we from the from from day one built on existing networks, uh, and really see this as a as a joint as a joint initiative um, we are working on uh, together. Um, now Nigeria today is basically uh, the country level. Um, event for Nigeria, and then uh, our next event will be in, in Cairo, Egypt uh, next, next week. So we're really, really happy um, to be here. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so if we, if we now think of what has been done uh, so far, um, you will hear later on that um, MPS is not the only one CGIR initiative. In fact, there are in total 33 initiatives, and uh, some of them are also working in Nigeria. And so part of the objective of this event is to make sure that all the one CGIR initiatives working on Nigeria on policy issues from day one start really working together on important topics like we have heard uh, from the colleague from the president's office this morning, um, investment priority setting at national level, subnational level. What should the government be investing in irrigation, extension, um, other things? And, and, and what are the returns to such an investment? It's just one example 
of how different initiatives can, can, can work together. And in order to do that, we are developing a dashboard so that we know who is doing what and so that we can work hands in hands together um, with the government. And the idea being that there is uh, one voice, one strong message rather than many, uh, too many uh, messages. So the whole idea of coherence building uh, is making good progress. Uh, the next slide, please. Now here, integrating policy tools um, this is uh, really very much related to analytical tools in terms of economic models, in terms of micro simulation models, all kinds of tools that can help us better understand how the economy is working, how the food system is working, and what kind of policies and investment can improve the life of the people. Um, we are very much following a training of trainer approach. And again, it's important um, to be present in a country. And we have CoA here with IFPRI, we have IITA, we have, we have other centers so that we follow a trainer of the trainer approach, um, which means instead of only having a one week training workshop, we'll have a continuous exchange between our researchers and uh, the Nigerian researchers. And you can see a couple of examples here of how this has already happened for Kenya and India. And then uh, Kwa will, will, will say more about what the plans are for uh, Nigeria uh, very soon. Sorry, one back. Um, so what is a really important part of this is the rapid response team. And in, in the case of Kenya and Nigeria, uh, we had intensive discussions with many of you and there about the implications of the global uh, food and fertilizer and, and energy crisis so that we together do the analysis rather than separately. And the result I think is quite impressive. And, and you have seen um, some of the, of the results this morning. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this is just an example of um, how research can not only impact policy, but how the international and local media can also be informed um, by research. And you can see some of our studies on Egypt, um, on the implications of the Ukraine-Russia war have really been picked up in a, in, in a lot of you know, big newspapers like the Financial Times, Washington Post, Bloomberg, Deutsche Welle, and, and, and others. So that's an additional dimension of, yes, we are informing policy, but we are also informing people, the public, through the media. Um, and you could see today there was also some media. So we are trying to also translate our findings into public knowledge uh, in that sense. Um, next slide. So this is, uh, this is the example that Kwa was talking about this morning. Um, we are conducting together with, uh, with IFPRI and Foresight team and, 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 and other partners, really country level analysis. Um, and you can, you can see the, um, the results for, for Kenya uh, over there. Again, an example of rapid response. Policymakers don't want to wait for five months, six months, seven months until the research is done. Sometimes we have to be really quick and that's important for the policy impact that we are aiming for. Uh, next slide. Now here is a, a very draft idea that I want to kind of put on the table. How do we bridge the policy science gap? And our idea is the so-called policy community of practice that we are trying to put in place uh, in, in our countries. And this is a, a rough idea uh, for Kenya. And of course, each of those uh, community of policy practices have to be country specific, but it can be maybe an inspiring example. Now, if we think of the, the highest level of people that we are planning to influence, maybe we should put the president's office there now that I see the colleague sitting. Um, but essentially in Kenya, we have three main 
the impact partners, how we call them. The first one is the Ministry of Planning and National Development, because we know that food systems go beyond just agriculture. It's a lot about trade, it's a lot about industry, also about health and, 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 and social protection and, and other things. Um, then uh, Kenya, as well as Nigeria, are quite decentralized countries, and I was happy to see the representative this morning uh, that represents the, 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 the state. Um, so in, in Kenya, it's called the Council of Governors um, that is representing the 47 counties um, in Kenya. And because a lot of decisions are made at the county level, it's really important that we also have a, 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 a channel. Um, and then, of course, uh, last but not least, in that first row is, is the Ministry of Agriculture, of, of course, as, as, as one of the key partners. Now, are we working directly with the minister on a day-to-day -day basis? Of course not. I mean, we may talk to the minister every now and then, but the minister himself or herself has a group of advisors, or in some countries, even a think tank. So in the case of Kenya, under the Ministry of Planning and National Development, we have what we call the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, KIPRA. You may have heard about it. It's the number one or two ranked think tank in, in, in Africa. And I have just learned over lunch, we have an equivalent here in Nigeria, which has actually the mandate to provide evidence-based research and advice to the Ministry of Planning. So maybe a similar setup could be envisaged here. Um, for the Council of Governors, they actually have uh, a unit on planet, uh, planning, monitoring, and knowledge management. Um, again, their mandate is to provide evidence to the Council of Governors. And again, this is a, a very good entry point for us to, to work with in terms of joint research, capacity strengthening tools, et cetera. Um, and then within the Ministry of Agriculture, there are actually two units that we are working with. Uh, one is on, um, on research, and then the other one is, is a pretty new one, what they call um, the ATO, Agricultural Transformation Office within the ministry. So those are, if you, if, if you think about it, um, our, our, our main uh, research partners. Um, let's say level one. And then level two, of course, there's a lot of other people. The, the one of the colleagues this morning was asking, where's the central bank? Where's the Ministry of Finance, etc." All these people are very important. They are part of the community uh, of policy practice. Um, of course, we are also engaging with our international partners. And in many countries, including in Kenya, probably also in Nigeria, there is a development partner group which already meets, I don't know, every month, every three months. Again, in, 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 instead of working with 10 donors, we'll work with that group. And instead of creating a new committee and a new council, we work with existing um, council and, and, and strengthen them. I'm not a big fan of building parallel structures. They are not sustainable. We need to work with the structure that is already out there and we need to strengthen those, those structures. Um, so what are some of the tools? Um, first of all is a, is a seminar series where we present and discuss and dialogue with the community of policy practice on the latest research findings. Um, there are also bilateral policy exchanges Sometimes it's better not to discuss preliminary findings in public, but to get input from the ministries, from the presidential office, what are their thoughts, what are their questions, and there can be, can be a lot of uh, uh, good discussions uh, on, a, on, on a bilateral um, exchange uh, platform. And then, of course, the technical expert uh, consultations are, are, are critical to this idea. So I, I just wanted to give you a broad idea what we mean by policy community of, of, of practice. And, and we're looking forward to, to working with you to see what makes the most sense um, in Nigeria um, for a sustainable setup um, of, of such a policy community of practice. 
Okay, so with that, that was a, just a, a brief overview of, of MPS, and uh, we are all looking really forward to working with all of you on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Clemens, for that. So quickly, I'll invite Kwao Andam, the country program leader and the country lead for the NPS initiative to give us his own uh, uh, overview of the activities for the Nigeria uh, component of NPS. Thank you. Well, over to you. Thank you, Hyacinth. And I trust that uh, since Clemens has already set the stage, this will be quite brief. So I'm going to present the work plan for the NPS for Nigeria. Um, in the next slide, you'll see, and, and this has been developed really with uh, Clemens and the initiative co-lead, Alan Nicole, and the other work package leads for, for NPS. On the next slide, you will see the um, figure that you have seen a couple of times this morning, and hopefully it's becoming more and more familiar now. That just shows the links between the three goals of NPS, um, building policy coherence, integrating policy tools, and responding to crises. And really what we hope is that uh, eventually this figure will be um, stuck in the minds at least of all of us who are working directly on NPS and our, and our partners, because this helps us to see the interrelated nature of these goals. Um, the next few slides, will, I'll, I'll give you a bit more information about how we are already starting to work in Nigeria on these goals. So first, on building policy coherence, which Clemens has just described, um, the key question is, what are the areas of um, policy coherence and incoherence in policies that impact land, food, and water systems in Nigeria? And how can we prioritize these policies and increase their coherence, right? And so we want to do this especially for, um, we want to do this especially for federal and state level agricultural policies. I think we heard earlier in the morning about sometimes the disconnect between what's happening at the federal level and at the state level. And so to do that, um, we are planning to have, um, as you'll hear today about the CGIAR initiatives, we are planning to have a database of the engagement in the country, um, a series of um, research papers on you know, fertilizer policy in Nigeria, food, land and water policies, and also on the policy communities idea that Clemens has shared, and some dissemination pieces, seminars, blogs and webinars coming out of that. So on this first goal, um, our key part are the Ministry, um, APRANET, and IFDC um, on the fertilizer issues. On the next slide, you see the second goal, which is integrating policy tools. And a key part of this work here for us is the um, sub-national policy priority setting. So what is this? This is essentially looking at um, state two states um, to start with that we'll work with um, uh, on analysis of policy options and how to develop priorities in the state level um, agricultural policies. Our proposal is to work initially with um, Delta and Kano states. And this is work that we will be doing um, to look at the, the kinds of priority investments that are needed at the state level, also at the federal level, um, in order to achieve policy objectives. Um, this work is uh, um, being, will be done in partnership with NISA, NBS, NGF, the state ministries of budget and planning, uh, among other partners. And this is where the uh, training of trainers approach will come in. So we'll have um, IFPRI staff, um, NISA colleagues, NBS, NGF, the state uh, um, policy analysts, all um, engaging in the trainings um, on, on social accounting metrics building and subsequently additional data collection um, for refining the sum that will come later in the year. So this is really an, an, another exciting piece of the NPS work that we will be having this year. And then thirdly, um, my third goal um, here is um, responding to crises. Um, so on the next slide, um, you will see that uh, 
a research question then and you you have already seen this morning some of the initial work that we have done on this uh, on this goal and the idea is to do the short term analysis uh, so specifically thinking about the current crisis that we are we are in um this will be work throughout 2022 but then we are also thinking about how to set up systems and be in the medium term um uh, responsive to um crises that may come up in the future and any any um threats to resilience and uh, and and economic growth really and so the expected outputs for 2022 under this work um we, we would um work with our colleagues who are going to use a micro simulation tool um, based on household survey in nigeria to look at um to look at, at a finer detail you we saw the economy-wide impacts today one, one thing we'd like to address is um what are some of the micro impacts um and so that's what this work will do we'll also be working with our colleagues a colleague from abc on a political economy toolkit for crisis policy design so that's another deliverable for nigeria this year and again under this goal will have a series of papers and dissemination events um, coming up in the year. So again, a lot of exciting work here. Clemens mentioned that in Kenya there's the ARD. In in Nigeria, the equivalent is the Agriculture Donor Working Group, um, which includes um, development partners such as USAID, WFP, UNDP, and others. And we have already uh, been engaged in some of this uh, analytical work um, that WFP and FAO are doing, and you've seen the FP work as well on on the Ukraine crisis. So that will continue under this partnership. So those are the three goals. And uh, this afternoon, the breakout groups that we'll have after the presentations of the initiatives are um, designed along these three goals. And so we, we hope to hear from you in terms of the questions that we are addressing, the partnerships, the data needed, and so on. So thank you very much. On the next slide, um, yeah, I think that's the, the last slide. So I will hand it back to you now, Hyacinth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kwao. Next time, thank you. So at um, this point, I will invite uh, Kwesi Atakra, the country and engagement lead with Central Africa, once again, uh, for his uh, presentation. Kwesi, over to you, please. Are you there, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can see my screen, which is being shared. <clears throat> yes. Uh, this presentation is really to give you a little bit more about this one CGIAR that we have been hearing about. Excuse I guess me. the first point I should say is that NPS is not an orphan. NPS is a child that belongs to a family. So I want to present to you what that family is about. And Hello, later Kossi. on, you also. Hello, Kosi. Yes, please. Please, can you go into presentation mode? OK, just a second. OK, thank you. thank you. So later on, you would also hear from some of the sisters and brothers of NPS, in other words, the other initiatives. Uh, within the one CGIAR. So, what is this one CGIAR we hear about? I indicated this morning that this is really an attempt to bring together all the 15 CGIAR centers that we are so familiar uh, with, uh, to bring them together in a dynamic reformulation of our partnerships, our knowledge, our assets, and our global presence. We really feel it will give us a much solid clout to address the major global issues we are confronted with. And that association then aims at greater integration and greater efficiencies amongst all the work that we do with partners, uh, and especially in the face of the 
challenges we are facing uh, today. But one important point I want to make at this juncture is that the CGIA, the one CGIA does not replace the CGIA centers as we know them today. If pre continues to be if pre, IITA will be there as IITA. SEAT uh, will be there. Now, what this one CG is trying to do is to really strengthen the bridges across these various organizations. And we see these centers as the essential building blocks of the new aggregate organ. If you look on the right, you will see some of the key elements of one CG. In the middle, you have a compelling mission. We have a unified governance, which governs all the one, all the 15 centers, including the CGIAR research programs, which have all been merged into this outfit. We have an integrated operational structure, which defines how we work. We have one set of policies and services. 3C is very important. We have one CGIR at country and regional level. And I'll say a little bit more about each of these. And we have a new research modality, which I will also uh, mention shortly. And finally, we have more and pooled funding, funding that enables us to do the work that is planned within one CGIR. So you may ask, why now? I mean, we've been working for over 50 years. We've had some very good results. And uh, we have produced a lot of impact in various countries. So why now? And the reason why we have to do this is because we are faced with a challenge which requires even more efficiencies coming into the work we do. We need to improve food and nutrition security, we need to increase biodiversity. Economic growth is a key element that needs to be strengthened. We also need to strengthen resilience and all that. And all this we have to do at once. You know, so we recognize that individual centers will take bits and pieces of this. But what we're trying to do is to pull it all together so that we can see how we are affecting the global issues in an aggregate manner. Now this reform has received a lot of attention across the globe. We have some very strong points that have been made. Um, the G7, for instance, said we commit to leveraging the power of national and multilateral research institutions such as the one CGIAR. This is critical to generate knowledge, strengthen innovation systems, and ensure partnerships accelerate the pace and scale of innovation required to make food systems resilient and stable. And uh, we have quite a number of them. I just want to read one from Bill Gates. And he was saying, as the CGIR system launches its new ambitious 10-year strategy to accelerate climate solutions for food, land, and water systems, the current level of investment in CGIR research isn't even half of what is required. So the point really is that the CG actually needs to do and receive funding uh, even more uh, to be able to to be able to accomplish the job that is there to be done. Now we have the one CG has come up with a new research and innovation strategy, which you can see the whole thing on our website. It's called a CGIAR 2030. And in that strategy, it spells out very clearly what the vision is. And our vision is a world with sustainable and resilient food, land, and water systems that deliver diverse, healthy, safe, sufficient, and affordable diets. 
and ensures improved livelihoods and greater social equality. So you could look through to the mission and to the impact. Uh, we have impact that is defined in five key areas, and I will be showing that uh, shortly. In terms of the research framework, the 15 CG centers and our 13 CGIAR research programs and all the work that we were doing through platforms all over the place, they are now aggregated into four major areas. Now, three of these areas are global in nature and one is regional. So we have science and regional groups that will deliver integrated research and innovation uh, solutions. The three, the first one is systems transformation initiatives. This is the one that addresses issues of enabling environment level solutions. And that includes policies, institutions, governance mechanisms at the national, regional and international levels. So you can guess NPS uh, would be in this particular uh, global group. The second big group is the genetic innovation group. This actually has been the hot uh, bed of CGIAR progress over the, 50, the last 50 to 60 years. This is where our work on breeding uh, in technological solutions, varieties, and seeds uh, at farm level is generated through this program, the genetic innovation initiatives. And the third global initiative or the global group is the resilient agri-food systems initiatives. And that also consists of farm and landscape integrated technical and socio-economic solutions for resource poor smallholder farms. You will notice all these three are global. Now, what it means is that the work that is done in these three areas will be analyzed at a global level. For instance, if you're talking about uh, climate change adaptation, it has impact all over the globe. So you will find that kind of work being organized at a global level, but with implementation within regions. Now, the fourth big area, which you see in the middle, is a regionally integrated initiative. And I will shortly be talking about what are these regions where one CGIAR is going to operate. So additional, to the work that will come from the global initiatives, there is also a specific integrated initiative that is targeted at the particular regions where we are going to work. So that is a framework in terms of how our research is going to be conducted uh, and managed within the one CGIAR. Now, every work that we do will lead to impact in what we call five impact areas. And these impact areas have come from the sustainable development goals. So there is an impact area on nutrition, health, and food security. There is an impact area on poverty reduction, livelihoods, and jobs. We have gender equality, youth and social inclusion, climate adaptation and mitigation, and finally, environmental health, and biodiversity. And all these are making specific contributions to the sustainable development goals. I have put on the screen just some of the initiatives in Nigeria, um, some of the initiatives of one CGIAR that will have implementation in Nigeria. I know I haven't captured it all, but just as an example, you know, so you can see the national policies and strategies. Uh, you can see gender and social equality. There is something on agri-food systems. This is a regional integrated initiative. 
There is aquatic food systems. There is something on plant health and rapid response. Uh, excellence in agronomy is critical. Rethinking markets. For genetic gains, you need to have tools, technology, and services. And you need to look at also at accelerated breeding to meet farmer specific uh, needs. So these are some, and you may be hearing some presentations on some of these areas. I've been making references to the regions. This whole regional engagement is one of the new dimensions of one CGIAR. We never used to have such an integrated function looking at regions or even looking at countries. Right now, the one CGIAR has identified six regions of the world where work is going to be done. Um, and three of these six relate to Africa. So that tells you the importance of Africa for the one CGIAR. The first group, the Siwana, is the Central and West Asia and North Africa. The North Africa is linked to that group because of the agroecology similarities. Then we have the Southern Asia uh, group, which is, which is here. And then we have West and Central Africa, which is this group here. So we in Nigeria are part of this West and Central Africa region. Then we have the Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Southeast Asia and the Pacific, which is here. And then East and Southern Africa, the East and Southern Africa region covering this space here. And finally, the Latin America and the Caribbean uh, region, which covers all that. So these are the six regions. And for each of these six regions, we now have a regional director who is going to be focused on the region as one CGIAR regional director with responsibility to facilitate and monitor and help the development of research within that region. For the West and Central Africa region, our regional director is Dr. Teranya Sandinga, who is also the director general for IITA. Another important and interesting development is that for each of the countries where there is major multiple CG initiatives taking place, there will be a country focal person identified. So you can have a country convener, but ultimately it will be turned into a country manager position for each of these. And this is all meant to minimize or avoid confusion in our operations at country uh, level. The regional groups, which is led by the regional director, and of course the country representation, they will have a set of responsibilities. I would not go through them now because of time, but I hope you would get uh, the presentation so you will be able to get into some detail. Uh, and, and here you see a whole listing of some of the key things that the regional director uh, supported by the country conveners will be working on to support the implementation of one CGIAR at country and regional level. We have a new engagement framework, a new engagement framework, which really endorses a number of key elements. I just want to mention the very last one, the element of alignment. Alignment basically means we cannot just work on any subject just like that. That whatever we do in alignment must be in alignment to something. And that something needs to be a country strategic goal, a regional strategic priority or goal, or it can also be a sustainable development goal at global level. So doing that demand analysis is going to be a key part of the functioning of one CGIAR. The supply element is then to say, what can the CGIAR 
put on the table. What can we bring in terms of our knowledge system? We don't have it all. And that's why partnerships are important. But it, it's important to know what you have that you bring to try to solve this demand issue. And when we talk about feasibility, it is also important that whatever it is we are doing, we assess how it is going to be done, who is going to be interested in supporting it in terms of funding and other areas. And all these are key things that will have to be done as part of one CGIR. I'm almost to the end of it. I think this is my last but one or two slides. But let me emphasize the critical importance of partnerships. Partnerships receives a new emphasis in one CGIR. Partnerships with NARIS, partnerships with regional organizations, partnerships with government. And that's why I'm very happy to see NPS and the work that IFPRI particularly is doing already in really having these strong links with government and government groups at very high levels. And I will try, I would like to encourage NPS and IFPRI not to look just at the project NPS, but really to see the role they can play as, you know, as an aggregate point that brings together all the work of the initiatives. And that's why this particular meeting is very important, having brought uh, some of the initiatives uh, to be part of it. Finally, there's the issue of capacity development, which if I had time, I would have shown you exactly uh, how we are planning to do it. But for now, let's just say that it is an area that is going to receive increased emphasis as we move on. So to conclude, I will say in summary, the CGIR centers are now coming together or have come together into a single organizational structure to enable us to manage our resources, our research and our relationships better. Secondly, new capacity dedicated to improving how we engage and align with our regional and national partners uh, has been put in place. We have a refreshed research strategy and portfolio to provide more focus on urgent global and local priorities most relevant to our mutual stakeholders. CGIR will match its partnerships to the specific challenges at hand and provide a single point of entry for its partners. Finally, let me thank our donors who have been part of this process. Uh, strong donor and investor backing in developing a rebirth global organization with strong alignment to sustainable development goals and impacts for countries and regions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the one CGIR. And with that, I want to thank uh, IFPRI and thank the entire NPS team for inviting me to give this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kwesi, uh, for that uh, insight into the one CG IR and the initiatives. So uh, if we look at the agenda, um, we have the policy component of the CG IAR initiatives in Nigeria. Uh, Kwesi at line I listed out some of these initiatives. Some of them are working in Nigeria. So we'll take very short presentations from these uh, representatives of these initiatives. Um, we'll have nine of them, please. For want of time, we want you to keep your presentations very uh, short, three minutes, uh, I would say <laughs> maximum. So on this, I would like to invite the first uh, uh, initiative uh, on breeding resources initiative. The presenter is Young Guan Li. He will be doing that virtually. Young, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, I will share my screen. Um, all right. So, uh, so thank you. Oh, oops. 
sharing my screen. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to briefly present an overview of our activities in Nigeria. Um, as has been previously mentioned, Nigeria is a hotbed of activity for um, the CGIAR's uh, breeding research programs. And um, the Breeding Resources Initiative, uh, which I lead along with my colleague Sharifa Syed Alwi, um, is focused on providing the critical services um, that are uh, important for um, uh, developing the best possible optimized breeding research programs. And the um, so why we have this initiative specifically called out um, separately from the breeding programs themselves is that we have this initiative so that we can focus on bringing the most modern practices, technologies, and analytics um, uh, uh, into uh, CGIAR and NARS breeding programs. Um, and the, ultimately the impact that we're going for is uh, we want our breeding programs to be data-driven and using the most advanced technological resources um, so that they can achieve greater impact and also greater efficiency. So the um, breeding resources um, work packages have, um, there are five of them, and there are roughly there's three types of work packages. We have one that's based on um, strategy. So um, planning of the uh, investments that we want to put into um, the various countries that are involved in the initiative. Uh, we have three um, work packages that are focused on um, the actual uh, services themselves, the tools and services. Um, uh, and, and we have a fifth one um, that is all about supporting the adoption and um, uh, the, the, the making routine of the use of these services and new tools. Uh, so this initiative is a part of a, a set. Um, uh, there's uh, five uh, uh, initiatives in genetic innovations that are quite integrated with each other in terms of how we operate. And I hear I call out some of the uh, some of the initiatives that the breeding resources initiative is uh, very closely uh, working with, I, and I think you'll hear from a couple more of couple of these today. Um, the, our biggest partner is, of course, with the accelerated breeding initiative, uh, which uh, organizes and houses the the breeding uh, programs themselves. Uh, but we also have uh, collaborations with the market intelligence uh, initiative and the gene bank initiative. The, um, when we first developed this uh, initiative, uh, we went through a stakeholder consultation process um, where uh, we really uh, surveyed both uh, CGIAR and NARS, uh, about 50% CG, 40% NARS respondents to find out um, which, were, which were coming up as the most prioritized um, uh, uh, tools, technologies, and services that were um, uh, that would that people thought were required for um, uh, breeding modernization, and we got uh, actually uh, uh, broadly consonant uh, results across um, multiple regions. And some of the um, some of the things that I would like to point out is that uh, some uh, the all all of the um, the, the top technologies that were identified include um, genotyping, high throughput phenotyping, and quality and nutritional analysis as a critical components of a modern breeding program, and um, data management mechanization and uh, quality management systems came out as the some of the most important services that were being requested. And of course, funding and lack of infrastructure um, was identified as the key barriers. So um, in this initiative, uh, we really have a priority to, in terms of our partner engagement focus, um, we, are, uh, uh, we are putting our uh, uh, co collaboration with the NARS breeding partners first and foremost. And uh, what we would like to do over the next, uh, over the course of this initiative is that we would like to work with uh, the, our NARS partners so that we can design tools and technologies and services so that they meet the context specific needs for the local breeding programs. What we really want to, and where we really want to end up is that initiative resources and local experience should um, result in fit force purpose services that increase the national capacity for agricultural research and development. And I am very much looking forward to working with our partners to understand the demand and the potential 
for um, uh, the investments that we can make in breeding research infrastructure in Nigeria. So, uh, and I think that's it for myself. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Young. Uh, you tried to keep to time. So um, I would like to invite uh, think this time around in person for the presentation of Fragility, Conflict, and Mobility uh, by uh, Prakash Kant. What will, will, will you prefer here? If, yes. <laughs> Please sit around up for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ifri, for this opportunity. Conflict, Fragility, and Migration Initiative is one of the latest of all the CGIR initiatives. That's why most likely you didn't hear anybody talk about it because. We are in the process of formulating it. We're done with the concept node. We're right now writing the proposed. And this initiative focuses on fragile and conflict areas. Why do we need this initiative? Because we feel that there has been insufficient attention to fragile and conflict areas, taking a food, land, and water system lenses. And there's limited attention to what the effects of migration in, these, in the roles of FLWs. Also, we feel there is urgent evidence is needed for policies and programming to support inclusive migration patterns, conflict prevention and peace building challenges that the CGIR is uniquely placed to address. So this initiative has been designed along this context. Next, please. These are some of the challenges which we face in the FCA areas. A lot of you have heard this today through different presenters. Of course, we to recap it again, it's about 1.5 billion people that live in the FCA areas and they're facing rising food prices, hunger and livelihood challenges. Some of the other challenges they face is climate change, poor governance, violence, extremism, lack of social cohesion, gender, and social inequalities, now the latest one, the COVID-19 and the Russian-Ukraine war. Of course, there's a lot of migration going on in these areas. Migration can support livelihoods and protect against fragility and conflict, but even voluntary migration can create new risks and challenges to these areas. In total, 84 million people have forcibly displaced worldwide. 80% of these 80% experience acute food insecurity and high level of malnutrition. CGIR with its wealth of knowledge in food, land and water systems in agriculture is uniquely positioned to address these challenges using a system approach. Next one. Nigeria is a priority country uh, for us. And these are some of the statistics. I don't know if you've seen the press release from the UNRC that came out yesterday. So it's out of the press. At least in the Northeast, which would be categorized as the FCA area, you have about 4.1 million people in Northeast Nigeria are at risk of severe food insecurity in this lean season alone. In 2022, 8.4 million people need humanitarian assistance across Borro, Adamawa and Yobe states alone not counting all the six states of Northeast Nigeria and probably other parts of Nigeria. Approximately 1.74 million people under five are expected to suffer from acute malnutrition across Northeast this year. Of these over 300,000 are expected to suffer from severe acute malnutrition and they could die if proper care is not given to them. Next, please. This picture provides a snapshot of what is happening in the Northeast. We are implementing program along these lines right now funded through USAID by the Feed the Future Initiative, Economic Growth, Dawn was here a while ago. So we're implementing, so we know what's going on. And this picture provides you a glib, snapshot of what's going on. There's conflict, there's Boko Haram insurgency, there's farmers had a conflict, there's people that are migrating and lives having lost. And these people deserve livelihood 
as because livelihood is a right for these people as well. Next, please. Therefore, these are some of the objectives of the initiatives that uh, we are formulating. The initiative will provide evidence on conflict, climate, and gender sensitive policies, programming, and investments to improve livelihoods, reduce poverty, and promote gender equality and social inclusion. And by 2030, the target is to reach 10 million people globally, in the, at least in the FCAs. Working at the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus in FCAs in partnership with stakeholders, the initiative takes a four-pronged approach, which are structured into four work packages, anticipate, bridge, stabilize, and accelerate. The first work package, which we call the anticipate, will provide global and localized analysis and will support technical development and operations of conflict sensitive and migration inclusive early warning and early action, uh, action initiatives, which will be designed inclusively taking into account that will benefit women, youth, migrant, host communities, and other vulnerable groups. Next. Work package two, the, in, the initiatives down here will bridge studies, will study emergency operations serving conflict affected and displaced persons and host communities along with the STP Nexus. And it's more research oriented and it will be questioned and they have some research questions like who, where are these hotspots? Who are the vulnerable population? How are they impacted? What needs to be done? So that's something we plan to do under uh, work package two under bridge. Work package three focuses on stabilization of the communities that we work. It's evaluate gender sensitive programming to one, stabilize livelihoods in fragile settings and two, support migrants and host communities. And lastly, the work package four. This work package is quite unique. It's all about scaling innovations, innovations and best practices that CGIR, like you have heard, we've been in the action for the last 50, 60 years. So all these, how can we bring all these things for the benefit of restoring peace, creating harmony, you know, uh, restoring livelihoods in these FCA areas. That's what this work package focuses on. And it, 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 it'll, it'll develop a set of scalable innovations to address critical challenges affecting food livelihood water systems, including that uh, newly emerging during the life of the initiative. And what we envision is setting up a challenge fund a challenge fund that will be able to fund these kind of initiatives. So if you look at most of the initiatives that CGIR has, is focused on certain regions or corridors and certain areas. This one, Work Package 4, is very unique in the sense that it addresses the emerging crises as they come up in the FCA areas. And it's not focused to one corridor, whether it's Sahel or the, you know, Central America, or the Sudan, uh, Sudan area, or the Yemen, uh, the, the Middle East, or the, the uh, Central Asia area. And some of the, I want to elaborate a little on this, is that we have similar uh, FCA area in Nigeria, and what we are thinking, especially in the Northeast, where we have long-standing refugee camps and IDV camps, some of the low-hanging fruits, and some of the best practice of CGI that we can bring in those areas, and of course, our work on hydroponics, maybe those are the things that we could be doing in these areas. Similarly, the vertical gardens. Similarly, there's a lot of technology that's available that right now in developed countries, maybe a stove or crusher machine might be something very archaic. But if you go to these areas, there's a conflict between a farmer and a herder. A herder needs grass. A farmer wastes his uh, things after he harvests all those you know, uh, raw materials. All you have to do is if you can process it, and farmers and herders are people with money. They will pay for it. And we have seen a project that, you know, those are products that the farmers can use to sell them. And these kind of technologies, when you form a group, there seems to lack, uh, uh, minimize the, the, uh, the conflict between these groups. So just giving an example, kind of things that we can do. We can also look at, you know, agribusiness related to refugees. So those are the low hanging fruits. Uh, that we are envisioning, that we'll be able to come up with it. But of course, there will be a mechanism that will be set. There will be a criteria, selection criteria that we will develop, that will determine as to what exactly is the kind of uh, interventions that we'll you know, implement. Along with, as we see, there's sphere standards. I'm sure all of you in the emergency world know we have sphere standards, but 
We also want to contribute to the sphere standards from the FLW angle, that is, what are the kind of standards that we need for implementing agriculture programs in those kind of uh, you know, sensitive areas. And the last objective of this uh, work package is, of course, exploring demand and feasibility for work in the Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, and Central America, of course, pretty much all over the world. That's, that's why I said, you know, as the conflict emerges, we will be able to address it. The last slide that you see is basically, no, please go back. That's the, you know, uh, the theory of change, which I've explained every portion of it. And if you see at the end, those are the impact areas, our initiatives, uh, work packages will contribute. And Kawesi went through those five impact areas, so I'm not gonna go over it. And lastly, it's just a snapshot of, uh, you know, give you an idea about who are our partners, what are the locations that we will be working on. So these are still being finalized. And I'd like to thank everyone for uh, listening to this uh, latest initiative. I think this will be the 34th initiative of CGR once it gets rolled out. And hopefully it will start in 2023, January. And I'll, uh, just to let you know, this initiative is led by Dr. Katrina Kosek from IFRI, uh, Dr. Peter Ladebach from ABC, Dr. Sandra Nukstal from IDMI, IDMI, and Kate Ambler, who's leading the work package three from IFRI, and myself, Prakash Kant Silwal, which I'm leading the work package for. Thank you from IIT. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prakash, for that. So next on harnessing gender and social e equality for resilience in agri-food system, um, I invite, like to invite uh, Munaban uh, Amari from IFPRI for this presentation. Uh, thank you, Hyacinth. Uh, I'm going to give you some brief on her plus harnessing gender and social equ equality for resilience uh, in agri-food systems. This is led by uh, Nicolin Gihan uh, from, uh, and also Daniel Gilan. So I'm representing them. So maybe I'm not the best person to present this one but I'm uh, uh, presenting on behalf of them. So the, challenge, uh, the challenges gender inequalities remain high and which limiting uh, potential of women specialists from agriculture dependent communities. Uh, and the research question is just what innovation can overcome restrictive uh, social norms promote women's access to technological uh, resources and ensure policies and governance uh, gender and social equality in climate resilience uh, agri-food systems. And uh, the urgency and high uh, stakes on this uh, initiative is just uh, a challenge in equalities will get uh, worse in countries dealing with climate change. And uh, there is also an opportunity because the food system are transforming uh, and spacing opening for solutions on climate change. There is also using a hotspot mapping and partners in a country to target where inequalities are going uh, fastest. And uh, the final objective is just to stop and reverse uh, growing inequalities. So there are four uh, points in three uh, for this uh, to challenge uh, uh, tackling gender inequalities uh, under COVID, climate change, and conflict shocks. The first one is just to uh, empower understanding how to handle so, uh, social uh, technical innovation to empower women, partners, and drivers for climate change uh, solutions. And the second one is to transform, as this is a, a second work package, reducing normative constraints that limit women's economic resilience to climate uh, changes. And the, uh, the other is to protect gender responsive social protection to promote for climate adaptation and resilience and equality. And the, uh, the fourth one is to promoting inclusive governance and policy for women and resilience to climate change. And uh, there are four packages uh, on this uh, initiative. The one is just transform and empower and protect and voice. 
So each work packages have uh, different research questions. So uh, for Nigeria, uh, we are working on like transform uh, gender, uh, gender transformative approaches and uh, gender responsive social protection and inclusive governance and uh, policies. Next. So uh, the transform gender transformative approach have, uh, uh, have its own uh, research, uh, innovative research. So the first one is assessment of inequitable uh, norms and identifying leverage points and levers, levers uh, to intervene for deeper level uh, change and design and to test gender transformative approach with uh, partners. So the value of uh, preposition for this one is to uh, uh, regarded as ways to intervene in food systems as deeper level and lack of, uh, lack of guidance on where and how to intervene and specific uh, gender transformative uh, approach, design methods and tools to uh, uh, transform transformative change at scale. And with more food system actors targeting inequitable norms using a transformative uh, approach, women's capacity to build economic resilience and uh, that will increase. So the other, uh, the third is just protect gender responsive social protection. So it has also its own uh, innovative research. So the first is to support rural women in coping with adapting to climate change and uh, it is also to test with partners to address root causes of rural women's vulnerability to shocks and also to understand how social protection can be designed to boost rural women's climate resilience and reduce uh, gender inequality. So uh, the, the fourth one is uh, next. Yeah, voice. So it's promoting inclusive uh, governance and policies for women resilience to climate change. So the the this work package has a innovative research approach with test partners innovation strategies to stimulate women's voice and agency uh, to climate related community level and analyze with partners how public and private sector policies, laws, rules and procedures can support women's resilience to climate change and also to support stakeholders use of evidence to promote policies and governance which expand women's voice and agency. And it has also value uh, reposition, like inclusive governance is critical, like growing stakeholders' interest in that lack of guidance on specific scalable innovation strategies and public and private sector policies. And also to raise a uh, need for uh, that in, in inadequate existing development uh, indicators and tools tracking women voice and agencies. So these are the uh, initiatives that are uh, part of the uh, ongoing initiative of CGRI. So thank you very much. Thank you Mulu, for keeping to uh, time. So um, next uh, is uh, market intelligence and product profiling. Um, that will be presented by Herbert Kramer uh, from IFRI. Yes, and I'm joining remotely. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Okay. And I hope my screen is also uh, showing up, the PowerPoint. Is the PowerPoint showing? Yes. Show okay, PowerPoint. good, good. Please. All right. So, so uh, my name is Barbara Kramer. I'm a senior research fellow with the markets um, uh, institutions and trade division at uh, IFPRI. Um, and I'm also leading a work package in the one CGIR initiative on market intelligence. Uh, market intelligence is one of the initiatives within the genetic innovation theme that was uh, uh, that, that Kwasi spoke about earlier. Um, so here's a little bit of background why we have a separate initiative about market intelligence. Um, what we've experienced in the last few decades um, is that a lot of the investment decision making in genetic innovation um, is actually very much um, unilateral and technology driven or supply driven. It's driven by what technologically breeders might be able to accomplish, um, as opposed to looking at what is it actually that the market needs, that the consumer needs. Um, 
And I think this is an important part of national policy strategies as well, thinking about, you know, how do we invest in genetic innovation, what types of investments in breeding are being prioritized. Um, and this is why I'm so grateful for the opportunity to present our initiative um, here in the launch of the MPS initiative. Um, and so uh, one of the key challenges that uh, we're trying to address with genetic innovation in the one CGIR is, is that uh, currently variable turnover is really slow. Um, we see that varieties that are grown by farmers in the field have a high average age. Um, and so this means that new technologies being developed are not reaching farmers um, as soon as we would hope in order to really have impacts with investments in breeding at the scale that we could have. We're not there at the frontier in terms of reaching those impacts. Um, and, and we also see that product profile design is and targeting what is the focus of breeding uh, efforts is often focused on agronomic and stress tolerance traits. So for instance, making sure that varieties are producing the maximum possible yield or that they are tolerant to drought. Um, but a lot of other important impact areas for the one CGIR are not always considered in designing targeted uh, product profiles uh, for which breeding is then being done. Um, and so you could think of, for instance, nutrition is a, could be a really important breeding objective. Um, gender equality or equity could be improved through breeding investments. Um, but, but the investors need to be knowing, okay, what is it actually? What are the traits and what are the um, types of investments that they can make in order to have impact in those areas through breeding? So that is sort of the, that is the type of market intelligence that this initiative um, is aiming to generate. Um, another reason for why we have a separate initiative on this is really to empower social scientists and national partners um, with knowledge and with the methods to generate market intelligence and then subsequently take that into product profile design and setting kind of breeding, um, the, yeah, having, having breeding products for which investments can be tailored. And then finally, we see market intelligence being limited, for instance, crop specific, or uh, very um, region specific, even though there might be global trends that are important to monitor. Um, and so also here linking with NPS uh, will be really crucial uh, when it comes to both market intelligence could inform national policies or strategies, but also the other way around, um, policies and strategies that are being prioritized could have implications for the market intelligence that then feeds into what should breeding um, be invest, what type of breeding investments to make. So that is a little bit on the why. Why do we have an initiative around market intelligence for more impactful breeding? Um, our vision then is to really maximize investment returns in breeding um, seed systems and, and other initiatives also working in this space um, within the CHIR. Also working with partners to really um, strengthen co-ownership and co-implementation with NARIS partners, with private sector, with NGOs. Um, and, and really the focus is on more than just uh, having an impact on yields. No longer looking at you know, what were the objectives and maybe what a green revolution, whereby it really was a big push for increasing yields, but really looking at the five impact areas that the one CGIR has more broadly. So focusing on nutrition, environmental health, gender equity, um, livelihoods, and also uh, resilience and climate adaptation, really taking a, a more holistic perspective and maximizing returns in each of those impact areas. So that's the vision for the uh, initiative. How do we work? Um, we have a, a chain of, of work packages that kind of follow on each other. So it starts with market intelligence, gathering data and insights um, to segment the market and identify what different market segments will need in terms of uh, future products. And we're not talking here about maybe ne next year, but we're thinking about 10 years from now because um, what goes into the breeding pipeline now could possibly be released in 10 years. So we need to have that forward looking lens. So that starts with market intelligence. Um, also focusing on impact challenges. So in the different um, areas of the SDGs, 
um, where can, you know, where are opportunities, where are gaps and where can breeding contribute? Um, as I said, there's market segmentation. And then those two together, we have the global impact challenges and regional market uh, segments. Those two together identify, help us identify opportunities. Um, how many people in a certain segment can be impacted in a specific um, impact area, for instance, um, how many people are undernourished in a given market segment and with more nutritious crops, you could help address that undernourishment uh, in, that, in that market segment. So that's, that's the first step. Then we go towards now prioritizing um, and setting target product profiles where gender is very much um, taken into consideration. Um, so these product profiles will have sort of, they, they sort of set breeding targets. Um, here's an example that is for instance saying, okay, yield should be increased by 10%. That is an absolute necessity for any um, new variety that might be coming out of the breeding pipeline. But then in addition, um, maturity needs to be, an, this needs to be an early maturing variety. It needs to be white maize maybe as opposed to yellow maize because that is what the consumer is looking for. So in that way, the target part of profiles are being set. Um, then that goes to the accelerated breeding initiative, um, which was earlier presented, um, and it would also um, eventually result in new seeds that the seed equal initiative will focus on, okay, how can we get this into the market? And then there's a feedback mechanism in terms of, okay, now what is the impact um, in terms of people and opportunities that you see drawn here with the orange line? Um, then the work package um, that will primarily um, uh, you, you might primarily see in Nigeria in this more global initiative is work package three, which is called behavior intelligence. This work package is starting from the assumption that even if you get the market intelligence perfect, you have the varieties that match um, consumer demand perfectly, that match farmer demand perfectly. Farmers and consumers are not automatically going to adopt those new varieties or products. That takes time. And how can we accelerate that process? What is driving people's decision-making um, behavior to adopt new varieties and products? And what can we do to influence those decisions? Um, so this is this you could almost see as a, as a marketing division um, within the initiative. Um, and then with that knowledge, we take those different pieces together and in the initiative build pipeline investment cases saying, okay, these um, target pro product profiles combined with the behavior intelligence that has been generated in Work Package 3 and the market intelligence that is um, helping us estimate the returns on investments in breeding, in different um, breeding pipelines. Um, in terms of each of those five one CGR impact areas. So in terms of nutrition, in terms of gender equality, in terms of livelihoods and jobs, what are the impacts that we can expect from these investments? What is going to be the return on investment? So that's what's being done in Work Package 4. And that is an output that might be um, of use also to the, to the partners in the room here today. Um, including an investor dashboard that we will be producing as a very tangible output where you could say, okay, in this market segment, um, which pipelines could I potentially be into investing in and what will be the return on those investments in the different CG impact areas. Um, and then finally, we have a work package that will really closely engage with NARA's partners, with NGOs, because this package is around institutional scaling. This new approach to um, market intelligence and setting priorities in investment, um, uh, in, in, in decision making around investments in breeding, this new approach that is taking much more a market intelligence approach. Um, uh, work package five is around, okay, now how do we institutionalize this? How do we scale this up so that it's not just, you know, in the one CGIR that we're doing this, but that we're working together um, with different partners around the globe involved in breeding and investment decision making and breeding, um, applying this um, more widely, this new approach. So, so and, and we'll be providing a proof of concept in a way through this initiative. So that's uh, on, on how we work. Just quickly to highlight that instead of being bottom up focused, where the, we start from a specific crop and a producer lens and environment and what we can do with technology, 
broader the focus is more saying, okay, what does the market actually need? Starting from the consumer um, and focusing on who and why are we trying, who are we trying to reach and why are we trying to reach these people instead of, you know, what are we trying to produce and where and, and how. Um, so that's a, a bit of a difference in uh, thinking of, of about, um, uh, about breeding investments. But that's, that's what this is about. Um, so as I mentioned, behavior intelligence, the work package, this is the work package that I'm, I will be leading. Um, this one will be uh, working also in Nigeria. And in that context, we'll have a series of experiments that answer this question that you see on the screen. What drives farmers, consumers, and private sector decisions to adopt new varieties and related products. Um, and so, um, yeah, we'll be reaching out to some of you in the future to start co-designing those experiments because we would very much like to work um, with people in the room here on these experiments. Um, and then finally, um, what are the expected outcomes from this initiative? Um, there's a few things that we're really trying to change and be transformative in. One is a goal is to shorten the research lag so that um, there's faster breeding and easy earlier adoption of new varieties. So that's one reason for why you see this curve in the figure um, shifting to the left. But then there's also shortening the adoption lag, which is very much um, what behavior intelligence, that work package is about, making consumers and farmers adopt new varieties and products faster. Um, which shifts the curve further up towards the left, and which means that we have an impact at a larger scale faster. And then finally, having a higher adoption ceiling so that more farmers adopt new varieties coming out of, of, of breeding pipelines. So in that way, having a larger impact overall um, through more impactful breeding investment decision-making. Um, now, also changing the, the priorities or the focus of these investments, um, instead of putting a lot of emphasis uh, or most emphasis on SDG goal two on zero hunger, also focusing on other SDGs. And in that way, having, as you can see here in the picture, having a more balanced impact in different areas of, um, of the sustainable development goals. So it's not just changing the impacts in terms of size, but also changing the SDGs in terms of where we see those impacts um, and having, for instance, a larger impact on gender equality. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it back over to the room there in the chat. Thank you. The next presenters, let's, let's keep it short. We'll still have uh, an activity, the uh, breakout section, please. So, okay, so this is Alejandro Bertrand from IITA on plant health and rapid response to protect food security and livelihood. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay, very good. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction and in the policy aspects of the Plant Health Initiative. This is a global initiative, uh, but with heavy presence in Nigeria for all the five work packages. Uh, next one, please. Yes, so the objective is to protect uh, plants and the crops uh, from pests and disease outbreaks by lever leveraging building uh, viable networks using uh, an array of national, regional, and international uh, institutions to develop and scale plant health innovations. And the focus is on high impact and high risk uh, pests and diseases that cause major food security shocks. Next one, please. So this, this innovation, uh, this initiative was developed uh, by consulting partners, uh, demand partners, innovation partners, and also the scaling partners. It's not something that was just decided, but there was a lot of consultation. And that, that, that is how we came with the, with the initiative. Next one, please. I'm not going to go into the details of the each of the work packages, but there are five of them. One is on threat identification and characterization, on preparedness and response. Another one in integrated pest and disease management. One on mycotoxin management that IITA leads. And the fifth one is on policy aspects on gender and social inclusion, impact assessment and communication on, on policy, uh, policy actions. Next one, please. 
there are seven seven ex expected outcomes by the end of the three year uh, phase of the initiative. I'm not going to go into details, but many of them have policy implications. Next one, please. Especially on developing science based plant health policy briefs. I, I think that this has been mentioned mentioned during the uh, discussion that uh, we need to have this evidence based uh, data. So it will be turned into a policy brief. Next one, please. Yes, so being a plant health initiative, it has to um, have a lot of collaboration with other initiatives in crop production, uh, accelerated breeding, uh, seed systems, gene banks, and a few other technologies and, and initiatives. So, but not only with these initiatives, we are going to be having this collaboration. Next one, please. Yeah, also there is going to be a lot of uh, interaction and collaboration with a regional integrated initiatives in the different regions where 1CGIR operates, also with the national policies and strategies like we're having this interaction and we hope to continue the, the discussion and the interaction. But I also would like to mention that I'm, I was very interested in the fragility and conflict uh, initiative that I think that we have also a lot of scope for collaboration. So this initiative addresses several policy aspects like uh, promoting and stimulating multi and interdisciplinary collaboration, the support for region and country led development, impact assessment and feedback loops, gender and social inclusion. This is a very important component of the initiative and communication for, for policy change in the different countries. Next one, please. Yes, so engaging regional and national stakeholders is key for successful of uh, the impact assessment. So there is going to be a lot of consultation before these impact assessment activities uh, with potential uh, for potential innovations that have high impact in the different countries. And during the impact assessment, there is going to be the, help, uh, the need to identify adoption constraints faced by the smallholder farmers, help to design the effective promotion methods to increase adoption of the technologies that are available, and help with the data collection and implementation of field experiments. And of course, after this impact assessment of the different technologies, there is going to be the need to disseminate these findings and en enable policy uh, changes. So there are three major policy related outcomes from the initiative. One is on the development of awareness, advocacy, and policy briefs with very, very clear actionable uh, recommendations to target countries, including Nigeria. Also, there is going to be uh, an enhanced on, in, on the uptake of plant health innovations. As I mentioned, there are too many already developed but have not been scaled. And also based on science, um, science evidence, uh, plant health policy briefs will be developed and investors and decision makers in these target regions are going to be um, called together to enable an environment for, for scaling of these plant health innovations. I'm going to finalize very soon, but in some cases, the, the ecosystem is already there. Like here in Nigeria, where we have an ecosystem for aflatoxin mitigation, in which every, everything is, is there for creating impact, including private sector support that has been one of the common topics during the presentations. But, next one, please. So this one has a, a large, um, uh, potential for creating impact for producing safe and nutritious foods in this case, but there are some some elements of this ecosystem that are not there. For example, there is a lot of support for um, from from the government of Nigeria to use these integrated mycotoxin uh, management strategies, but there is some component that is missing, that is about the testing and at the at the end of the season for farmers to know whether the crops are safe or not. So these are very specific elements that are needed for this type of, of, of uh, ecosystem to be complete. So this is, this is one of the type of uh, collaborations that we want to have with the, with the MPS in Nigeria. Next one, please. Yes, yeah, so we want to um, have collaboration with MPS on cross-sectoral collaboration with various ministries of agriculture, of education, of finance, gender, health, we want to converge efforts of relevant stakeholders to, for, to enforce food security and safety policies. And we want to design strategies to scale gender responsive and socially inclusive uh, plant health innovations 
that do not have a for-profit uh, motive. And those are the ones that are more difficult to be, to be scaled. Next one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alejandro. That so I'll quickly invite Professor Benedict Tregunev of World Fish for the presentation on resilient aquatic food systems for healthy people and planet. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bernadette Fregene. I'm representing my colleague Sunil Sirewadana, who is not around. He is the coordinator of Wallfish program in Nigeria. So the Wallfish will be in charge of the resilient aquatic, uh, resilient aquatic. Uh, aquatic food systems for healthy people and, and the planet. And the expected benefits are to reach out to 4 million people, meeting the minimum, sorry, meeting the, sorry. I know, yes, it's okay now, sorry. Meeting the minimum, I'm sorry, I can't bend my neck. Meeting the minimum micronutrients requirements, it will also impact the 7 million people who will benefit from the CGR innovation, as well as 3.5 million women that will benefit from the CGR innovation, as well as a reduction of 5.8 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent annually. And finally, 3.8 million hectares brought under sustainable management. In terms of the main focus, the aquatic system will invest in effective aqua aquatic was we invest in effective aquatic food system governance. It will also inform, it will also be informed by research address the multiple threats by eliminating the key systemic challenges facing the sector, as well as offer transition pathways to a more just, nutritious, healthier, lower carbon and climate resilient food system. In terms of the main approaches, we'll address it based on the following key systemic, systemic challenges. The first is the lack of data. So in addressing this issue of lack of data, effective data systems will be set up. That will be the work package one. For the second world package, for the second world package, fisher folks usually fail to consider the interests of stewards of aquatic commons. That is usually the fisher folks and the fish farmers they exploit the environment on an unsustainable manner. So we are going to also ensure that there shall be sustainable expectations of these resources. Under the work package three, aquatic foods usually have great potential to enhance water productivity, provide nutritious food, income and employment opportunities. Which, are, which contribute to climate change, mitigation and restoration of land and water system. But they are usually overlooked in water resources management. I don't know how many of you know that the, our water bodies, the reservoirs, the fisher folks have to pay a lot of money to be able to culture fish in those water bodies like the cages in the reservoirs and it's, not every, and it's not accessible to the fisher folks and the fish farmers as expected. So our approach will be to ensure that fisher folks and fish farmers have better access to water bodies. On the, on the work package four, 
Genetic improvement programs in agricultural research have focused on crops and livestock and limited in farm fish varieties with potentials to minimize environmental impacts, reduce the, gas house, the greenhouse gas emissions and increase profitability for small scale farmers. So what, what the approach of wall fish is to ensure that genetic improvement programs of fish species with lower food conversion ratios are developed as well as production of fish feed that will use less fish meal. And, and finally, while there are many potential solutions to aquatic food system challenges and innovations to seize opportunities, they have been scaled because national agricultural innovation system don't extend to aquatic foods. Therefore, Wallfish with her partners are going to develop aquatic innovation systems. Our research questions. Sorry, am I too fast? Okay, in Nigeria, in Nigeria, World fish will only participate, will only be involved in World Package 1 and World Package 4. So World Package 1 research question is that what information and data are needed at different scales? What tools, approaches, and partnership to generate data? And how can the evidence generated by aquatic food research influence policy making and private sector decision and investment. Uh, since 2019, Wallfish have been involved in several surveys, more than five different surveys, uh, farm characterization, consumer fish and food nutrition security, youth involvement in aquaculture, uh, diet, diversifying diet and empowering women in Nigeria, and uh, gendered aquaculture value chain. All this data will be mainstreamed into work package one. Now work package, work package four, it is how to develop faster growing strains of tilapia with additional resi uh, re resilient traits that improve returns for smallholders while reducing environmental impacts as well as care for multi-species rearing system to return for smaller holders and to develop sustainable genetic improvement programs. Now, um, in April, Wolfish succeeded in bringing in the gift tilapia. This is something we have desired. That is the aquaculture value chain actors in Nigeria have desired it. Usually they go as far as Thailand, uh, Malaysia to get them. But now, Wallfish has brought in the first set for, to, for this uh, dissemination to the value chain actors. And this is a major breakthrough. That's a genetically improved gift tilapia that grows 30% faster than the average tilapia. And it can grow to one kilo within six to eight months, depending on the management. Then the other thing, what uh, Wallfish will also do, they have started the survey on catfish characterization. So we hope at the end of this results that Wallfish will be able to come up with a genetic improvement program to Im Im improve the catfish in Nigeria and get, to, and get over the problem of inbreeding. And as well, Wallfish plans to introduce other fish species because presently, Nigeria is a monospecies dominated country, that's the catfish. So we hope to introduce other fish species so that the consumers will have a variety to choose from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So um, let's quickly, I will invite the local Adenyoju of IFPRI, Nigeria office, 
on the Rethinking Food Markets and Value Chain for Inclusion and Sustainability Initiative. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all press cordially observed. Um, I'll be presenting uh, the Rethinking Food Markets and Value Chains for Inclusion and Sustainability Initiative, which is led by Kate Ambla, Hiroyuki, um, Futoshi, and Bedru. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us today, but they've given me the opportunity to present this very innovative uh, initiative to you all. Just a little background on why this initiative is very important, particularly at this time. Uh, from all indications and from all we've been discussing today, there's no doubt that the food sector is very critical to economic development. And um, this is, apart from its contribution to um, global employment and, um, and GDP, you would all agree with me that food is life. And I think I was recently discussing that with my colleague after, uh, during lunch. And in the past decades, a lot have been done and a lot is, is currently being done to tackle hunger and food security in the world. But unfortunately, this remains too common phenomenon that continues to worsen with severe evidence from Africa. And of course, there are many factors contributing to this. We have the current pandemic, endemic, and even the current um, Russia crisis. But however, uh, some scholars have attributed this to weaknesses and inefficiencies in value chains and market integrations and structure. Now, the neg negative implication of this is not only fed by people, but also the environment, which actually takes me to the goal of this initiative. Sorry. So it takes me to the goal of this initiative where we'll be looking at how to influence policies and market behavior for the creation of efficient and inclusive value chains, which create fairer uh, income sharing, better job opportunities and adoption of sustainable practices along the food system. Now to the graphical part of, of the slide, we'll be leveraging you know, both current and um, new innovations, informations and incentives and policies to achieve this goal. And the goal is actually to ensure that food is available, affordable, more jobs are created, and poverty is reduced in a way that doesn't hurt the environment. In as much as we are trying to achieve all of this, we want to ensure that the environment is equally preserved. Now, this initiative has been packaged into four work packages. Uh, the work package one uh, will focus on making globally integrated value chains more inclusive and efficient in an environmentally sustainable way. Now the work package too will focus on domestic food value chains. We'll be looking at pro product integration, certification, as well as business, business models for inclusive and sustainable domestic and sustainable domestic uh, food value chain. Now the work package three will focus more on um, cross value chain services. We'll be looking at innovative logistic and digital financial services from which actors along the supply chains can actually benefit from. Now, these three work packages, we focus on um, piloting bonded innovations. Uh, we'll, be look, we'll be testing the effectiveness of different innovations, uh, looking at their collaboration with each other, and also looking at uh, supportive and uh, favorable policies and market incentives that could aid adoption of this bonded innovation. And this will be actually used to identify uh, or to determine the scaling preparedness and actions to implement, to enhance the scalability and um, accelerating the scale of this piloted innovation. And of course, we, not, we, we, we not realize that in as much as there will be a lot of synergies between the work packages and even with other initiatives, there will also be some trade-off and we, we will be assessing this trade-off and working with a number of uh, relevant stakeholders along the, the supply chain. Now, the fourth work package will focus on developing knowledge sharing platform uh, into which the output of these other work packages will be fed. And now coming to Nigeria, the work packages two and three will be implemented in Nigeria. Now the work package two is more product oriented and then we'll be focusing on um, fruit and vegetable uh, value chain. Now for the work package three, it is more service oriented and we'll be focusing on um, 
innovative logistic and digital financial services. And of course, uh, we know that we cannot work in isolation and we'll be working with a number of partners across the public sector. Although this is not finalized, um, uh, but in the private sector, we're looking at uh, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and the uh, Rural Development, FMART. In the, public sec in the private sector, we're looking at East West Seed and a number of other uh, relevant stakeholders. Just to emphasize more on, on the two work packages that will be implemented in Nigeria, the work pack package two, which is on domestic food market and value chain. Now we'll be uh, scoping for process innovations as well as product innovations, uh, looking at, okay, there was a project um, implemented by HIFRI back in 2020, where we actually um, developed solar power cold storage Cold storage is in the northern area. So we hope to actually scale this. We hope to revisit this during the course of, of this, um, the implementation of this initiative. Uh, also, we'll be looking at uh, improved varieties um, that could actually, uh, that could scale local consumptions and also increase the profits of um, factors along the supply chain. We'll be looking at improved seeds that could raise farmers' income because the essence of this is actually to generate better outcome for actors along the, the, the uh, supply chain. Also, we'll be looking at inclusive value chain contracting and looking at uh, different business models that can raise profitabilities for, for actors. Now, the general concept about this initiative or this work package is not to focus on a single innovation, but to look at bonded innovations that can actually work together to uh, yield better livelihood and economic outcome for actors. Now for the work package three, um, like I said, is, is more um, service oriented and uh, we'll be focusing on logistics and digital financial uh, services. Now the major question we are trying to answer here is how can we develop modern logistics and financial system that addresses inefficiencies and missed opportunities in value chain? And uh, we'll be looking at a um, digital platform for payment, um, digital credit platform, digital insurance platform that can actually benefit from us. Now, we are not looking at something big. We're just looking at something uh, that SMEs can actually benefit from. And in the logistic also, scoping is, is ongoing. And uh, we have identified a number of um, logistic companies here in Nigeria. And we are still trying to identify more partners to implement a pilot project later, later this year. So for both initiative, efforts are ongoing and uh, we hope to have deliverables later this year. Now for the work package four, which is more of um, developing a knowledge platform. Um, the general idea of this knowledge platform is to act as a laboratory for best practices, um, platform for, for policy dialogue, and also a data repository where we can actually fall back on. Now, the second component of this work package is the agri-food uh, market policy uh, analysis model, where we'll be looking at consistent food uh, sector-wide data on income, employment, environment, and policy support. Now, we'll also be looking at a um, model-based policy scenario. We'll be conducting a number of model-based um, policy scenario analysis both globally and here in Nigeria. Thank you for listening. Yeah, great, thank you very much, Delapo. Uh, we'll switch over to Kwao, and I'm who will present on the Seed Equal uh, Initiative. Kwao, are you there, please? Yes. Okay. Well, hello again. I'll have the slide up. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Do you want me to sh to stop sharing? Oh, you shared already. Hmm. All right. Yes. Let's let's keep going. I see it on the screen now. Perfect. I'm, I'm going to be presenting this initiative, Seed Equal, with subtitled Delivering Genetic Games in Farmers' Fields. 
we can go on to the next slide. Um, so the main challenge being addressed by this initiative is the vulnerability of smallholder farmers um, to climate related challenges that threaten agricultural production. And we know this is an issue, especially here in Nigeria, inadequate seed supply and delivery systems. Um, and in, in effect, the, the fact that markets are unable to provide um, smallholder farmers with adequate quality seed. And this, the implication here um, is that the smallholders are often having to recycle seed or use older varieties, which, which makes, um, which, uh, which exacerbates the vulnerability to, um, to climate challenges, pests and diseases. At the same time, we know that there are improved varieties and, and uh, approaches to seed availability that are there and that have the potential to transform agri-food systems and to reduce yield gaps and to reduce the hunger months um, and other disparities affecting smallholder farmers. However, with limited access to and use of affordable um, quality seed, um, we, we still have um, th this, this challenge of moving well adapted varieties um, to smallholder farmers. So this is the challenge that seed equal is, uh, is um, trying to meet. And the overall objective of the initiative is to support the delivery of seed of improved climate resilient market preferred and nutritious varieties of priority crops to farmers. Um, this initiative was instantly um, being launched in Nairobi, Kenya um, this week. There are um, several packages. I'm going to focus on the policy component, which has the objective to generate evidence and engagement on seed policy, investment, and regulatory issues. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows the um, entry points for um, uh, policy in seed sector development. And if you look at the policy options, the items in red here are some of the areas where we expect to, um, to, to work um, closely in collaboration with, uh, with our partners, such as NASC and others in Nigeria. So we have identified a number of areas, testing, registration and release rules, trade policy, investment policy, um, production subsidies for seeds, phytosanitary requirements, quality assurance regulations, um, agricultural input policies in general, and then market and trade policies and regulations. Um, we, we have identified this um, red circle here that shows the point from um, the point where we see the missing link, right, in terms of how policies can, su can support the, um, the delivery of seed delivery of, uh, of improved seed to smallholder farmers. And this really, um, we, we are focusing on the, on the stage from variety release um, through seed production, marketing distribution, and then used by farmers. So to give one quick example, we are already working um, in the area of pot borer resistant cow pea seed in Nigeria, which is a recent release um, approved by the government of Nigeria. And part of our, um, our our work will be to evaluate the impacts of adoption of pot bar resistant cowpea. Now, as part of that um, project, that related project, we would like to use um, some of the resources from Seed Equal to further understand the um, policies around um, registration, release rules, um, uh, uh, quality assurance, and in fact, how quality seed is able to get to the, the into the hands of the cowpea farmers. So apart from um, uh, work on cowpea, we expect to have work on other crops in the next two, three years, um, probably um, maize, um, which is scheduled also for release. Next slide. So this slide um, lists some of the outputs of the policy component. Again, remember I'm focusing only on the policy component of seed equal, but there are a number of other um, work packages. So under the policy component, we expect to have um, the following outputs, um, evidence-based policy recommendations over the two th three years um, that can help to advance uh, the, the um, seed system and market development specifically. 
Um, this includes um, improved capacity of our partners um, to conduct policy analysis on the seed system. Um, we also expect to develop new, um, new data um, and measurement systems for monitoring and evaluating um, policy change in the seed system. And lastly, um, to produce evidence of, uh, of impact, um, specifically on the example that I gave for cowpea, but also in other areas. Thank you. Um, back to you, Hayes. Thank you, uh, Kwao. So uh, the last but not the least uh, uh, initiative on transforming agri-food systems in Western Central Africa will be uh, presented by Amina Aroma, which really, Amina, are you there? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Yes, okay. I'm here. So okay. let me share my screen. Okay. So after his presentation, uh, please, if you have any question, I know a lot of us have questions on this initiative, just uh, put them together after the, uh, the breakout session or during the breakout session, you can ask uh, this question. Oh, I'm already here. Okay, maybe we just have one or two comments, right? Okay, one or two uh, comments, but for questions, uh, we'll just take that after the uh, the breakout session. So over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm excited to present to you uh, the transforming uh, agri-food system in West uh, and Central Africa TAFS initiative, um, which uh, is led by myself, Amino Aruna, with the co-lead of Regina Kapinga uh, based at uh, uh, IETA. So as you can see, this is the regional uh, integrated initiative for West and Central Africa. So all the initiatives you have been hearing are global, but also intervene in, in, in West and Central Africa as a region. So as Kweshi has mentioned before, for each region, we have a, a, an initiative which is more integrated and this is what I'm going to present to you. Um, so this regional integrated uh, focus on West and Central Africa uh, and is covering in general about 22 uh, country. And we have uh, nine uh, center uh, which are involved. You can have, you, you see them here. And among these center, you have uh, CORAF, which is a regional uh, organization also covering um, uh, coordinating the research of our national partners in West and Central Africa. Uh, so the initiative is covering the 22 country, but we are using a phase in approach. So for the first uh, phase of the initiative, we are focusing in three country in West Africa, including, of course, Nigeria, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire. And in Central Africa, we are focusing mainly on DRC, uh, Rwanda, and Burundi. And as a regional integrated initiative, we are targeting the five uh, impact area which was mentioned before by Kwesi uh, in his presentation. So uh, in terms of challenge, and, and key challenges in, in the region, in the West and Central Africa, uh, a number of presentations has already mentioned them, but what we should, we should know compared to other regions, one of the most important challenge that we have is the low productivity, the gap that continue to exist between the potential uh, yields and the current yield that we have. I think this is a particularity of West and Central Africa region in the world. And this situation is going to be aggravated by the climate change. So one of the questions we, we want to address then is how do we address the challenge in order to have farming system that will be more productive, but at the same time uh, adapted to the climate change. 
The second aspect is about food. We know in West and Central Africa, one of the key challenge is both uh, malnutrition and also um, uh, aspects of food insecurity. So we have the both situation. And here we are trying to see what are the critical factor that we can analyze in order to make sure that uh, uh, population in West and Central Africa have access more to biofortified and more nutritional food. And the third category of constraint is really the market access. Market access for both input and output. That is very important. And it's also uh, contribute to the adoption of the technology. Because sometimes when our technology are not adopted, is basically related to uh, the, the, the inaccessibility, you know, to uh, both input and output market. So the last uh, constraint here, which is also very clear in West and Central Africa, is the youth and women situation. If you take the youth, for instance, we have uh, around the highest rate of unemployment of youth and inequality uh, with, within the gender between men and women are also a uh, constraint that we have in the region. And this constraint, there are other constraints, but we think that those constraints are particularly uh, specific to the West and Central Africa region. So to do that, to, to, to tackle this, all this challenge, the objective of this initiative, and again, as a regional in initiative, is also to combine both socioeconomic and physical science in order to transform the food system to be able to respond to all these aspects. So in terms of priority of science to address these challenges, we have defined basically five area. The first one is uh, to make food system more nutritious, safe and resilient to climate change, as I mentioned before. To see, you know, today there are a lot of, of digitalization in agriculture, to see how we bundle those digital agriculture in order and uh, digital technology in order to increase the productivity and the resilience again of the uh, food system in West and Central Africa. Um, and the third axe of science for us is, of course, to use a uh, participatory tool set in order to develop a landscape management aspect. And that is help us to leave the production system to come at, at a level which is a little bit bigger of resource management as a whole package. And the fourth act or priority of risk of science, if you want, is how do we address the social barrier in order to create equal equality for youth and women uh, especially in engaging them more in business uh, and entrepreneurship. And finally, uh, the last one is how do we take all this innovation to scale in order to make impact on the ground? Because one particular of the regional initiative is that they have to make impact. They are not global. In their region, they have to make impact. So we have a special um, activity on that. So all these five, uh, science area were used to, de to design five work package, which are clearly interlinked. So the first work package will mainly work on everything related to sustainable intensification and diversification. The second work package will be uh, related to inform digital agriculture for climate resilience, for managing climate risk, and also uh, assessing to services like bundling, which I mentioned before. The third work package will include sustainable and inclusive land management for healthy environment and safe food. And the third, the fourth work package will be related to youth and women entrepreneurship model in the food value chain to reduce again uh, the youth unemployment and also uh, gender inequality. And the fourth work package is everything related to how do we accelerate investment in, uh, uh, in the value chain, but also to 
catalyze the impact at scale. And uh, we have also the cross-cutting of scaling uh, readiness on which I will not go in, uh, into detail. So in terms of approach, we have a phase-in approach, as I mentioned before. So the first phase one, we are going to start in humid and transition zone. So this is about all what is related to coastal region and highland area in Central Africa. And the second phase will now go to semi-arid and arid zone. In terms of commodity, we want to first start with root and tuba banana, root, root and tuba uh, and banana. Uh, the cereal-based system, like maize and rice-based system, legume, uh, cowpea and beans, but also uh, vegetable and not forget the uh, inland fish, which is also very important for a country like, um, like Nigeria, which the other presenter has already talked about. In terms of uh, geographic scope, scope, I mentioned before, in phase one, we are going to start with the sea country, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, Rwanda, Burundi, and DRC in Central Africa. In phase two, we'll progressively uh, going to other uh, coastal countries, but also Sahelian countries. So in terms of policy, because um, we have two research questions that are related to policy. Uh, the first one is in work package five, where we try to see what are the appropriate mechanisms and policy advocacy tool to facilitate access to finance and market linkages for youth and women. And this you can see, as I mentioned before, it's a very important aspect of access to market, access to finance for youth and women in order to increase their business uh, uh, activities. And to do that, we definitely need a uh, policy uh, mechanism, uh, policy advocacy tools. And finally, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the second research question I will say is related to uh, work package five, where we are also trying to, to see what are the most effective uh, use of advocates and media system to mobilize knowledge and community engagement, uh, you know, in order to change the behavior and reaching the target uh, group for making more impact on ground, as I said. So this here, for instance, is showing the theory of change of work package two, and you can clearly see that policy advocacy agenda is seen as one of the outputs of this work package. And finally, um, in terms of activity, we have already started uh, a number of activity on the ground. Uh, we have already, uh, we did last year in 2021, not 2011, the stakeholder consultation survey. We have, con we conduct also online uh, stakeholder engagement. We have already done the two lunch workshop for, um, for the initiative. We did one in, in, in West Africa, and we did one also in Central Africa. And we are also doing partnership with other actors in order to scale in and work together. But in addition to that, as you can see, we have clear collaboration with all uh, other initiatives that are also intervened or not in West and Central Africa, which I try here to put the linkages that we have with other uh, work package. But these are only initial, I can say, the phase in or the, the, the first step of initiative. So in the long term, we are going to engage also with other initiatives, especially uh, the next presentation that I hear here today. We need to work together. So finally, this is my last slide. Um, is to mainly present the expected uh, out uh, delivery for this initiative. We are expecting to target, uh, to reach almost 800,000 household farmer. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, digital technology, 300 million farmer are also target. Uh, we target also to, to reach for landscape development around 100, uh, rural communities. Uh, we are also targeting 2,000, 20,000 youths and 15,000 uh, women. And in terms of partnership, uh, we are planning to have minimum of uh, 10 key partner, partner 
which we will have strong uh, engagement in order to deliver on all this promise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll just take uh, two comments, maximum of two comments. So we'll have Dr. Andrew, sorry, and Professor Lomala, please. Just two. So over to you. Thank, thank you, Hyson. Um, uh, let me begin by thanking IFPRI again. I don't know if no, it's working. Yeah, let me begin by thanking IFPRI again for yet another opportunity to listen to the work of your uh, teaming scientists globally and to share their expertise with us. And maybe in this, my last comment, because I have to leave, I would like to reflect and give my reflection, having spent seven years advising government on agriculture at the highest level to IFPRI. I don't know if it will matter really, so I don't know who, are, who is listening, who are the decision makers on IFPRI, but let me just try to do a sober reflection. So first and foremost, I want to thank the, the gentleman that made the first presentation on uh, the global lead on the one uh, global lead on uh, on the NPS NPS initiative that is Clemens Clement huh? Clemens Clemens I think when I listened to Clemens first and foremost I felt very happy and I actually thought finally research and knowledge and policy and development are beginning to find alignment and everything seems uh, not headed. Everything was heading north until the immediate presentation that followed by my own good brother, Adam. And it railed out litany of initiatives and works already going on in Nigeria. But I cannot connect that presentation to the, to the uh, first one that Clemens made, which was showed the example of Kenya. And I could easily just think that in Nigeria, just on top of my head, could see how such system could be replicated, where you can have this national outlook in determining which areas uh, if we work on, how will the researches be collaborated? How, where will they even go uh, uh, have handshake. So when I saw the structure that he showed on Kenya, and I was just thinking of my head. So we have the National Economic Council, we have Federal Ministry of Agriculture. Under the National Economic Council, you have uh, uh, the, the Budget and Planning uh, State Ministry. Under it, you have the Governors Forum and their Secretariat working with the governors. You have uh, um, NIPS and all of that. Just we can mirror what he showed in, in Kenya, you come to agri with the Agri Research Council and all of that. But then when I began to see the programs that are already happening, and I cannot find a single agency in Nigeria who was mentioned or who can even tell me that, okay, they were in the room for their draft zero to formulate the research questions, the work, uh, uh, plan, whether work plan one, work plan two, the work strip. And honestly, I, I, I am at loss. So having spent seven years and looking at the, at, the, at the magnitude of what we are dealing with here, and there's nothing more than the icing on the cake with the last presenter talking about 80,000, 15,000 youth reach with digital. And here I am, am I in a country with over 70 million vulnerable, poor, like households that depend on agriculture for livelihood. So if we are looking at scaling, who are the agencies that will do this scaling? I listened to the fragility paper and what are you going to do? Do you even understand? Do you know the cost of maintaining one external expert to work in Boro State? What is the cost to the government, to the donor community versus looking at what Clemens uh, presented, I was hoping that the subsequent presentation will further narrow into a granularity 
where we have a one uh, a CGIAR that is decentralized with and thereby embedding experts within local institutions, research institutions, to be able to strengthen the vulnerabilities of the research institutions and holding handshaking with, 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 with government to make sure that policies are, are followed through. But we are creating parallels. So I listen to like policy discussion of entities, nationalities that have command and control. But I'm asking myself, for each of your problem, projects, you will not be able to do anything even within FCT without working with a government agency, without the door being open. I can tell you, seven years, federal minister of agri is not as important as a local councillor when it comes to agriculture policy implementation. Federal minister of, minister of agri sitting in Abuja is less important than a ward councillor who has the control, the ear, and the listening of his people, who know where it hurts them. And I didn't hear any alternative. I have had all of you, and honestly, I feel bad because I spent one year collaborating with Ifri and working on some of these works. And then we are discussing climate change and food system. But 99.9% .9 of all of the ideas presented offered no alternative. What other alternatives are available for building resilience, for dealing with climate change? Everything starts and ends with some genetic whatever, and I'm not against it, but where does it handshake with other alternatives, like the alternatives in regenerative uh, 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 agroforestry, ecosystem research, and all of that? Does it mean IFPRI does not fund this, or is it that when it comes to the 15 uh, institutions in Africa, they do not see this, the ecosystem research as a central point where we can begin to think about local knowledge and mimicking, using your scientific uh, uh, capacity to mimic nature. Why is everything down to one thing? So what's the alternative? Where is the openness? Where is the, is the justice in, 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 in exploring uh, solutions? So honestly, I, I, I looked, I listened to, the, to, the, to my sister talking about 7 million on fish. And I wonder, I have contact with 7 million farmers. And I'm asking, do we even know what it is, how long it took? It took over 34,000 foot soldiers to reach 7 million farmers in one year by government of Nigeria, just to know where they live. So now when somebody mounts such podium and tells me they will do 7 million, I am wondering, rethinking market, and interestingly, honestly, this is a sober reflection because I followed coal hubs here in Abuja, the orange market. Coal hubs has a major solar um, uh, storage. And I followed it for three years. If I take you there today, and I was there last month, it is under lock and key. Meanwhile, at least 10 tons of vegetables perish every day in that market. The, the, the sellers will not put it in the coal hub store. What is the problem? I followed Afla Safe. I was on national TV with man president, and he was challenging why Nestle will not pay premium for uh, Afla Safe mess. And Nestle said they will not. And then the man was there babbling and talking and whatever. And I told him, sir, listen, how many of your farmers know how to use Afla Safe? I spoke to mess farmers. I saw mess farmers bag shelled mess and sprinkle your afla safe on top and seal it off in the bag. And they say it's afla safe. Something that is meant to go on the ground and to, for the competitive microbe, the, the, the fungus to grow and compete with the harmful thing. You've not taught it. I, 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 I thank you. But honestly, if this thing survive, Nigeria would be the worst for it. Because I cannot see any handshake. I cannot see how this will, will help. I think C, CG, CGIAR has managed to restructure itself for the current realities of 21st century economy or 20, uh, heading out. But how does it affect the recipient nations? So you have shielded yourselves and you have created one system. It will bring in more investment. It will create more opportunities for the scientists. How does it rub off on the common man? 
who funds these things? So honestly, I cannot see the equity in it. And I'm, I'm just making a frank, frank and honest uh, 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 reflection because also I'm on my way out of government. So I'm preparing my, my last memos to advise government lessons learned in seven, eight years and all of that. But honestly, I cannot see hope. And let me say this on the last note. It's not your fault at all. It's the fault of the government where we are seated. If government in, uh, governments in Africa are serious, if Nigeria can even think about, what could you imagine a presentation about title called equal C? But there is nothing. And I'm, I'm surprised that the person even making the presentation is, does not know what are the laws, what are the codified laws that govern variety importation for research? At what period will it be released? There's even no mention where governments are serious. Equal seed will start by citing the extant laws that say this is how new varieties, uh, 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 organisms are taken into a country. These are the safeguards. These are the periods of hold. These are the type of facilities where they must be held. These are the researches that must be conducted before even uh, 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 commercialization and distribution. I didn't even see a Greek Research Council in that mention there. Neither did I saw Nigerian Agri Seed Council, I don't know if Professor is here, mentioned in passing. So it's not your fault. It's not your fault. But I am telling you, I think Africa is on a dangerous precipice. It is terrible. As imagine if today each of these agencies, if they have 10 naira, they budget 10 naira to even work with one of your scientists to bring it organism, see how it works, see how it is introduced. No we will give contracts for intangible goods and services where tangible bit will not be done. People will line. I thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Andrew Kosali. Uh, I will have, have an opportunity to to engage him in some of the evaluations we have done, but uh, he probably will not have time to attend. I, I think I am coming up in a, something similar to the comments he has made, but uh, uh, I think my is probably a little bit uh, uh, systematic. Uh, first of all, uh, sometimes we wonder why government is not investing in research. Think about the other time. Uh, what is the proportion of the budget that goes into research? And over the years, we have learned a lesson because we have uh, these actors in the research process. We have the researchers, the policymakers, the users of the research resort, and we have the people that must benefit uh, the research activities. But sometimes we are always challenged or engaged by government. We have been doing research now for the past 20 years. What, 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 uh, what, uh, what is the result? What has made the impact? Government wants results, and people also want results. And in one of the presentations in the afternoon, we did a general equilibrium, a CG analysis, economy-wide modeling, to look at the research, look at the income, look at employment, look at all that. Now, starting the research, there's no connection with employment. There's no connection with impact. The connections are on the field, they're on the experiment, they are, I mean, on the laboratory. That, that's where we are. And five years after now, we go and do uh, another economy-wide modeling and say, we do research, we spend so billions of uh, euro over the last 10 years. Now let's see what happens to GDP. Let's see, how does it with GDP? All these things we have itemized. How does it connect with GDP? How does it connect with employment? This is uh, research for development. And so when I listened to the lady from World Fishery and they showed me tilapia to be imported from Greek, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm from Mondo State. Has an, uh, the, the state has the largest, the longest coastline of the Nigerian uh, maritime region. We have river and area. We have maritime area. We have more than enough tilapia. Now we want to do research. Greek, Greek, Asian Greek, that's where we're bringing tilapia to Nigeria to say he can bring, 
what are we doing with our fishery research institutes in Nigeria? So let me ask, how many fishery research institutes are collaborating with you in the work packages you have designed? We have Neoma, you have uh, NIFA in uh, freshwater, we have every, every, everything. Nothing is mentioned about that. What happens to our tilapia? What are you doing to collaborate and to leverage on where we are in terms of breeding and genetic improvement of our cultural fisheries that this research will build on? So the foundation is not there. So we begin to see the kind of buying we will get into this. And if you do a risk assessment, the first problem we're going to have after the end of this research is money to import uh, tilapia from Greece. That's money we'll be looking for again in, in 21st century. So we need to, we need to look at it. the sustainability of this research. We, we need to look. But the major gap I first of all want to cite is that the connection with climate change here is not clear. Social inclusion, uh, uh, gender inclusion. It, where, where's the connection with climate change in some of the research? We are talking about some of this, uh, your seed, for example. What are, what are you saying about uh, energy efficient means of producing seed? And what technology solar power you bring in to assist the farmers in this area? So the, the, this research is hanging in there. So that at the end of the day, we cannot see where the impact. The impact criteria, the outcome area, we are talking about impact, are not emphasized. And we did not know the time when the power will be generated. It's not clear from the presentation, neither is it mentioned. And it's going to be very difficult to define in most of the things we are seeing. So the, the, it's, a, it's a very risk assessment is not done to see that when you do all this, are we, are we going to get the money to sustain this at the end of the day? And this is a problem government and people have about our research. We do research for 10 years, for 30 years, we've been working in the policy system in Nigeria. A cultural policy for that matter. We have not seen a major breakthrough. If we're having another round of research like this, and we cannot foresee the breakthrough we are going to see in five years, in 10 years, then, then we have not started at all. So this thing has to be reworked if we're going to get buy in of government and, and the people. Otherwise, I cannot see where the impact is. We don't need to reinvent the war, the, the wheel. We have research institutions. What is the collaboration are you forging here? We cannot see it. So that we move from where we are, so that we can see if it's fisheries, species we want to get, so that we can see all this gender thing and so on. Research is going on on this. So where, where is it connected with the climate change? It's, it, it's not clear. So the, 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 there's a lot of revision that can bring the result of this research to have better contribution, greater contribution to growth, to development in various subsectors, in a, the transformation of the sector in particular. And this is where we have major problems. So if the research is not problem solving, it's not contribute to employment, it's not reduce poverty, what are we therefore doing? So we need to connect it, this thing. Then the other time, talk about if it's called 10 to 1, it, it doesn't happen now. Nowadays, it doesn't happen. It's not as, as profitable as that. We have to do this risk assessment and go with some of the research we have. So that, that be, when we go into parallel, uh, parallel sessions or detailed analysis of some of the packages, maybe we have more contributions to make, but there are comments that we want to lay at this point. Thank you. Sorry, briefly, uh, I just want to add, lend my voice to this. I'm Engineer John Ladon. A lot of us seated here are from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, from what I gathered in the morning. And I noticed the whole presentation that was made here is quite related to each department in the ministry. And I cannot see a connection but we're all seated here from the inception from where it was conceived. And today we're seated here as members or staff of Ministry of Agriculture, which is saddled with the responsibility of ensuring food security in the country. The whole ministry has every concept of idea discussed here today. So please, it is time I think we, re, we rethink and recast the, the essence of any event. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, Prof, I know you have been raising your hand. Yeah, okay, just please, but quickly, quickly, just like a minute, please sit down. My comments are more than minutes, but <laughs> let, me, let me just say this. Um, one, quickly, the uh, presentation also dwell on the GDP. So I really want uh, IFRI and its partners to really downplay the use of GDP as a means to major good things happen in this country uh, using that GDP. Because when you look at the statistics, as GDP grows in Nigeria, poverty also 
gets up and unemployment also gets up. So there are other indices in, in Nigeria is one of the few countries in the world where you cannot use GDP to determine the social welfare. And secondly, I totally agree with some of the colleagues that mentioned the issue of connecting what we're doing with what, with what is on the ground. But I also want to say this. This is an international organization that has its own global mandates and is trying to domesticate it in Nigeria. And Nigeria is one country I know in Africa that does not have a clear strategy for dealing with development partners. And in that respect, we will come here and say they are not doing this, they are not doing that. It's okay. But it starts from what Kwasari said before he left. Some of us are in government, are still in government. We are expected to do our job, and we have not done it. And when somebody comes to do the research, and he's funding, and he's even funding some of your policy discussions and uh, formulations, which you are supposed to do and you haven't done, I think that person should be said, should be given some thank you note. And of course, at the same time, uh, encourage to, to do more and at the same time tilt it towards what is really important to the country. But I don't think this is the forum where we'll begin to say this has, not be, this has been done, this has not been done. I think this is a forum where we give some feedback so that this organization can make some improvements. But as Kwasari said, the fall is actually with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very, thank you very much. Yes, I agree with uh, a lot of issues that have been raised, but I just want to know that uh, the work packages and these initiatives are work in progress. So uh, we'll have a breakout section, especially for NPS, where your, your inputs will be harvested and helping to also improve the, the uh, activities or the works of each of these initiatives. Uh, thank you. So on this note, um, you have um, a piece of paper with number. One, some of us have one, some have two, others three. So we're going to break into these uh, groups. So we'll have group one here. Um, on poly, building policy coherence. So if you have um, number one, please, and we just move over to this side for the breakout uh, session. The session, okay, uh, for group two, if you have two, so to the back there, integrating policy tools. Integrating policy tools. So if you have group one, okay. Clemens is uh, facilitating group two. Clemens is facilitating group two. So over there. And group three, responding to crisis. Responding to crisis. So this side, my left. My left is responding to crisis. So group one, the facilitator is Charlotte Rebrand. Group one, here yeah, that's building policy coherence. Group two, the facilitator is Clemens Bresinger, integrating policy tools. That's right there. And group three, the facilitator is Malabran Amari. The group is responding to crisis responding to crisis this way. So if you have three, but three, please. And for those online, uh, please, your questions at the end of this uh, uh, section. I will just go in that order uh, of for a building policy coherence, integrating policy tools, and responding to crisis. So the report from breakout uh, group on uh, building policy coherence, I'd like to invite Charlotte Lebron to that. Okay, I'm, I'm the first one, which means I have the least time to, uh, to put together my thoughts on, on what was a very rich side of the room here. I wanna give them a hand. 
<laughs> so um, I think we could add at least another half hour to, to that discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you here what I heard, um, which I think will be very helpful to, um, to NPS. Um, so one, a couple of people said when it came to the first question about who are the key stakeholders that we need to speak with, they said, you know, you don't even need to listen to us list all those stakeholders because there are already some very good lists that exist of the, of the key stakeholders that should be reached. And not only did they say that, but they were very generous to offer to share those lists in case our IFPRI office in Nigeria does not have that. So the first one is already last year, there was apparently a consultation held in Nigeria between USAID and Michigan State University um, with a whole range of stakeholders. So that will be a very valuable list to, um, to get a hold of and to reach out to those people. And then also um, with regard to the new agricultural development policy, which is I understand going to be uh, released in the next few weeks. Also, there was a very extensive stakeholder outreach process um, that has taken place. So again, and, and I believe that list has already been shared um, with, with our colleagues in the, uh, in the IFPRI office here in Nigeria. So that is a very uh, valuable list as well. Now, more generally, when it came to stakeholders, um, every, I, I think you won't be surprised by, by calls to consult with all levels of government, um, federal, state, and local. Um, several interlocutors said a lot of these initiatives did not uh, talk about the private sector. So private sector is crucial. And we had one intervention um, that suggested that the stakeholder process should even in some cases be led by the private sector if we want that to be um, more impactful. Um, and private sector, of course, includes the whole value chain, right? So we're starting with farm groups, um, commodity groups, agricultural um, pr processors, it, it, everybody in, in the value chain um, should be very important. Um, the Bank of Nigeria was also listed as a, as a very important um, interlocutor. Central Bank, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, so now maybe um, I will go to a cup, two really strong uh, recommendations that came out of our group. Um, and I think these respond to question three. We had such a lively debate that we didn't get to question two. So that was my bad. Um, but on question three, so I think really two very important uh, pieces of advice to NPS. Um, this initiative can play a very important role as a facilitator in making organizations um, work together. And again, there was a reference to the new agricultural policy, which in fact already foresees uh, some provisions to ensure that ministries and agencies and also departments within agencies who often also do not communicate with each other, that they do that better. So if, if the, the, the group here felt that this was really a great space for NPS uh, to be engaged on. And then another very practical and I think a really good suggestion was for all of the initiatives, not just for NPS, but when you look at your work packages, it would be very important to have a stakeholder dialogue on those work packages in order to decide um, jointly with the stakeholders here in Nigeria about which work packages should be prioritized. And also within the work packages, which parts of the work programs should be prioritized. So I thought that was an excellent, very pragmatic um, suggestion. So I'll stop there. And um, but if anybody else from the group would like to chime in, please do. If I forgot something uh, important, anybody? Okay. What's that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please, another round of applause for uh, that group. <laughs> okay, next is Clemens uh, for integrating policy tools. Thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll do this together here. <laughs> we are, we're a team and, and thank you to everyone for, for your guys' contributions. 
So we'll talk about integrating policy tools in national institutions. And I would like to, to make one important point here. Um, we've been talking about NPS a lot today, national policies and strategies. We've also heard from a lot of other initiatives. Now for national policies and strategies, obviously the focus is on policy and strategy research. And for many other initiatives, as you have heard, it's maybe uh, for uh, on climate change, it's maybe on seeds, et cetera, which means that the main partners may be the same, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture, but within the Ministry of Agriculture, MPS would work more with the research policy strategy department, and then other initiatives would probably work more with other departments within the Ministry of, of Agriculture. Um, the same is true for, for, other, for, for other government agencies. For example, the Ministry of Planning, we have learned there is um, the Institute, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, NISER, which is very much focused on the broader economy, poverty, etc. So that may be a good partner for NPS um, and then uh, for other in, uh, initiatives, maybe, uh, may, maybe other uh, think tanks that are under the Ministry of Agriculture or the Ministry of uh, Environment may be more relevant. And the second point that I would like to make, yes, NPS can definitely try to, to play this role um, of of building coherence. I think that was, a, was a, a, a strong sentiment. But maybe over to you for the more specifics as to what the group thought um, okay. the relevant institutions. All right, so um, with regards to um, relevant institutions, because um, like he said, we are looking at an in initiative. We are trying to integrate different, not just policy tools, but as well as different people into um, what MPS is trying to do. So some of the comments from our group with regards to um, the first question. So there was special emphasis on universities because if we are trying to use the trainers of trainers approach, then we still have to in involve universities and not just ministries this time because um, in my own opinion, if we catch them young now, we can actually involve um, students within our, our training programs and as well as possible, these students actually go out and they already have knowledge of this tool we are trying to develop. So we don't need policymakers. I, I believe students should be able to carry out, use, utilize this tool to even carry out as a simple scenario analysis, even it's for a thesis or a master's thesis or even a bachelor's thesis. So that was one approach we, we, we made mention of, as well as local collaboration, because if we are trying to build, for example, a SAM, the level to which the SAM is highly disaggregated will actually have an impact on our study. So there is need to go down beyond just the national level, not just state level, but as well as local um, level. So um, with regards to the second um, question, so some of the challenges that they, they mentioned because um, work package two of the MPS is dependent on the availability of data and the quality of data. So they made mention of um, the problem of getting um, highly disaggregated data, as well as um, a participant in our group also made mention of the fact that the input output table for Nigeria is an old input output table from I think 1999. So um, estimates from those, um, that input output table, it's actually old. There was also a um, call for us to also help um, facilitate data collection, particularly uh, with regards to greenhouse gas um, emission, because they made mention of the fact that the Institute is there, but the capacity building is low. So that was one point they also they made mention of. And in terms of how to move forward with the NPS, so um, there was um, concern with um, regards to the focus of the NPS. So there was little focus on livestock because um, I know by, from my little knowledge of life, uh, livestock sector, livestock accounts for at least 80% of greenhouse gas emission in the world. So we should leave more focus on livestock, not just saying agriculture, agriculture. I think it's better we make it more uh, focused livestock. Livestock has to be part of it. So um, Charlotte also already made mention of integrating different research institutions into what we are trying to do. So there's a need to bring everybody together. Also, there was also um, the need to help with data collection because, for example, when we take these ministries, for example, 
a lot of them cannot actually fund a lot of data collection. Like he made mention of um, the representative from the, from the presidency. He said they had to use 34,000 um, data collectors to actually obtain data for how many institutes can actually fund that. So there's a need for collaboration with regards to this um, data collection, as well as collaboration with statistical agencies, not just at the national level, but we also learned that state, um, at, at the state level, there's also um, statistical agencies, so there's need for us to collaborate. So that was, yeah, that was just highlight from what we obtained within our group. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else to add from someone in the group? And I'll be in the same look. Yes, message. yes. Let maybe maybe uh, live now that I have the floor. I don't know if I get it again, so I better stay here and take the opportunity. <laughs> um, so I I wanted to really thank you all for 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 coming here. It it has been uh, really a great pleasure. Um, from what I have heard, I think obviously the onus is on the initiative, NPS, but also others to work more with local institutions. I really think this is, this is the key, not building parallel structures, but work with local institutions. The onus is on us. What I have also heard from some of you is a bit of self-critical reflection to say, actually maybe the onus is also a little bit on us and our institutions. So please feel free to be proactive to be selective and to be forthcoming, reach out to us and we'll be always very happy uh, to hear and to, to work with you uh, as much as we can. And with that, yeah, I would like to thank you again and hope to see you guys later a bit outside for a small chat or reach out by email or we see ourselves over, over dinner. So thank you very much. Thank you, Clemens. So um, that's not the end. So I'm inviting the translator of the last side uh, group, Lobran Amari. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, thank you, uh, please. Uh, Thanks for my team because they are very detailed. So we just finished the time for answering question number one. So we were in rush for question number ten too. But uh, as previous speakers uh, already mentioned, so the key uh, actors and stakeholders uh, in uh, in responding to crisis are so many. So, uh, for example, National Emergency Management uh, Agency, and also uh, Food and, uh, and Agricultural Related Response to Food Crisis, uh, FMARD, and Research Institutes, and uh, Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria. So, the response to agriculture and climate change crisis through research, and Nigerian Agriculture Seed Council, which is a regulatory for, uh, agency for seed development in Nigeria. So this seed development uh, in Nigeria can help in developing high yield crops and uh, Federal Minister of Finance for dispersing funds. Uh, there is also other federal ministries that are working in responding to crisis. Uh, and for on private sector like uh, Dangwete and the, is uh, providing food aid for uh, uh, for vulnerable households. And there is also transportation sector like aviation. There are evacuation of uh, people during crisis. And there is also security agencies that are working to help uh, uh, people in uh, during conflicts. So in, in response to question number two about like knowledge resource and data gaps, which is similar to the previous speakers. So uh, it is identified like lack of baseline data to indicate to indicate where we were and where we are. And there is also lack of synergies uh, between research organization for data management. There is also conflicting uh, data, uh, uh, data uh, measurements across institutions. 
And there is also weak capacity in terms of institutional, institutional and human capacity of uh, uh, government organization. And uh, in order to ab about the third uh, question, about the third question, there is a medium and a long-term research. So this one involves engaging relevant uh, personal <laughs> strategies and, uh, and also crisis must be disaggregated and developing a data bank and also developing uh, data collections and, uh, and engaging uh, relevant uh, stakeholders in, in addressing the crisis or in, uh, in order to discuss what have to do in, in, in a very comprehensive way. So these are the issues we are discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Amulu. That I think uh, yeah, be able to have a uh, uh, points from every member of uh, these um, uh, groups, and then uh, this I believe will guide the next uh, activities of each of the uh, work packages and uh, within the MPS initiative. So um, we are coming to the end of. This uh, today's uh, event. Um, well, let me invite the MPS Nigeria Initiative lead and the country program leader of APRI Nigeria, Dr. Kwao Andam, to um, give us highlights on the next steps. Kwao, please. Thank you, Hyacinth. Hello, Kwao. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Should I go ahead? We can hear you. Great. Well, um, good afternoon again, everyone. And uh, Thank you all so much for staying <coughs> through to this point. I also want to thank, of course, our um, uh, government partners and development partners, donors who, <coughs> excuse me, many of whom stayed throughout most of uh, today's um, discussions. And it's been <coughs> a very, very engaging, informative, um, packed day. Um, I think that we have, uh, we, ha we have been able to, I think, carry along this message about what we are going to be doing in NPS, but also in the other initiate in the other CGIR initiatives. And I believe Chrissy will say a bit more about that in a minute. On my part, I wanted to, um, in a sense, respond briefly to some of what has been said, and also then, <coughs> excuse me, lay out the. Um, lay out the next steps uh, um, that, that we see under NPS. So it's uh, unfortunately that uh, our friend uh, Andrew Kosari had to leave. I believe he's no longer in the room because he raised some very interesting points. And I want to thank uh, Professor, I think Olomola and Sagagi, Professor Sagagi as well for responding in part earlier. But um, just note also uh, that um, under these initiatives, NPS and the other initiatives, we have had a lot of um, stakeholder consultations starting from last April, in fact. Um, and these have um, carried through to the current versions of the designs of initiatives that we have here. I, this has been the case for the ones that I'm really familiar with, um, such as NPS, Seed Equal, um, uh, rethinking markets. And I believe almost all the other CG initiatives have been carrying out these stakeholder engagements. And so just to uh, assure Andrew, although he's not no longer in the room, that we are indeed consulting with the, with, with the stakeholders, including the private sector. I think that has come out um, clearly in group one, I believe, in the report back from group one. Um, similarly with C, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria and, and other partners. Um, as far as uh, building, you know, important point that Andrew made about building off of existing policies, um, we 
are very much aware that uh, the NATIP is about to be um, to be implemented. Obviously, we have been part of the development and consultation since uh, since last year, including the zonal consultations around the country in December 2021, and and the work that we did earlier this year with uh, Professor Sagagi and his team. Um, and so the, the important point that Andrew raises is, apart from the policies themselves, apart from what is on paper, we need to think about the, um, the level of implementation and the success with implementation. So if I take, for example, the example that uh, Andrew gave us about, um, about the cold hubs, um, and how we think about improving value chains, right? And the question becomes, um, what is it that that can make technology stick? Um, and this is uh, it's a very interesting point here that you can you can start to use the technology, but how can you um, ensure that it's it's used um, uh, uh, sustainably? Now, um, moving on from uh, from Andrew's uh, points to some of the um, suggestions that have been made, um, these are all very helpful to continue strengthening and deepen the stakeholder dialogues. We'll do that, um, thinking about what to prioritize. So thank you very much to the, the, the groups for um, bringing out this, these points and the additional partners that have been identified, for example, on integrating um, policy tools that we should work a lot more with the universities. And I should mention, this is actually why we have partners such as NISA um, in, the, in the initiative, um, because NISA already plays this type of coordinating role in terms of um, working together with universities on policy analysis. And so we will indeed, working with NISA and other partners, ensure that we, we, um, we bring in other policy analysts and researchers on, on also a number of uh, other topics um, that have not been mentioned yet. I should say that in, in today's presentation and discussions, we have focused a lot on the immediate work plan for 2022 for NPS, but um, note that this is a three-year pro, um, program. Um, these research um, initiatives that the CGIR has, has launched are not short term, they are medium term and indeed we hope to stay engaged um, even beyond that. So we have proposed initial steps and as I think was Heisen to mention that these are all um, work in progress in a sense. We are starting with some of the, the, the initial bites that we can chew on and we hope to take on a lot more as we, as we go along. Um, so with that, let me again thank you all for participating and uh, hand it back to Hyacinth and Chrissy. Thank you very much, uh, Kwao. So um, before I invite uh, Kwesi uh, for a closing remark, please permit me to recognize uh, individuals who worked behind the scene uh, to have this event uh, uh, coordinated and uh, made, making it a success. Uh, at least that's what I believe it is. Um, the, the staff of the IFPRI Nigeria office. First, Adetunji Fashionority. Please, if you're here, just uh, wave your hands. Adetunji Fashionority. Uh, Dolapo Adenyoju, Temilolu Bamiwiye, Joseph Ejima, Theodora Adene, Amina Basheo, Boniface Samuel, Hashim Mohammed. Benjamin Onoja, uh, Bedru Balana, maybe is not here with us, but he contributed a lot. And of course, the country program leader, Kwao Andam. I'm from uh, uh, DC office. I want to say a big thank you to the CPA um, staff, led by Charlotte, for their support. The, IT folks and they see, and of course, the NPS uh, initiative team. Thank you very much. And this 
So this is the, may I invite uh, Kwesi Atta, <coughs> country and engagement lead, West and Central region for the closing remarks. Kwesi, please. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Hyacinth. And uh, colleagues, we've come to the end of a very important day of deliberation. I think we should all feel proud that we have done uh, very good work uh, today. I first really want to appreciate IFPRI. Uh, I have been associated with IFPRI in different dimensions over decades. So I know the significance of what IFPRI does uh, in the policy uh, domain. And uh, I, one thing I like about IFPRI also and the way it works is that IFPRI has a very strong engagement with government. IFPRI really works by integrating the elements of policy research with government parties and government partners. As a matter of fact, they do that much better than any CG center does. Uh, and so I, I really want to thank IFPRI. Being part of one CG IAR, we expect that they will continue to play that uh, contributory role in ensuring that one CGI advances uh, beyond where we are currently. Secondly, I want to make a specific reference to the NPS. Um, the NPS, I really see it as a very good opportunity for enhancing the coherence of the policy dimension of the work that we do from the various initiatives that will be impacting on Nigeria through the one CGIAR. And I, I really would like to challenge the NPS uh, team, uh, not just to look at the little budget they have today and see what sort of work packages they have done and et cetera, et cetera, but they should have a clear space created on how they are going to facilitate engagement with the other initiatives operating in Nigeria with regard to their own policy concerns. And I think NPS must also, in trying to do that, uh, I believe there is a good opportunity for having a strong engagement with the regional director for the one CGIR Western Central Africa, so that this role can be understood at all levels. You know, first of all, at the level of IFPRI director general, but then at the level of the one CGIAR West and Central uh, Africa. And on the latter, I can obviously facilitate that. Um, it will not be complete if I don't make reference to any of the things that Dr. Kasari uh, said, because I think they are very useful points that he put on the table. And you need that kind of intervention to help you to improve. Um, what I got from a lot of what he said was the importance of strengthening the alignment of whatever we are doing to the country, existing country strategic goals, but not just to the goals. It's also important for us to identify the government agencies and the government programs that are attempting to implement these goals. And then to really go a step further to sit down with these agencies in a more, I mean, Kwao just said that, uh, of course, all the initiatives did stakeholder meetings. Yes, that is all very correct. But the challenge that Dr. Kosari is raising actually goes beyond you know, the stakeholder meetings. It really gets to get into the head of who is actually behind bringing about transformation in the country and how we can position ourselves to work more closely with those agencies. But having said that, I must also say it is not easy. The challenge has to come from both ends of the spectrum because at the end of the day, it also involves funding, it involves budgets. You know, when you go to engage NIRSAL or engage whatever groups, you, you really can't just go completely empty handed. You go with some technical, but also you expect that they will also meet you with some technical and sometimes some financial resources. 
So these are all areas that we will have to continue to look at as we continue to advance in this uh, program. Um, there was a very strong point that uh, I wanted to make a comment on, uh, and this relates to the issue of um, policy, the, the, the listing of stakeholders, you know, the stakeholders that we are going to be engaged with and also include partners. I just want to caution that sometimes it's very easy to produce a long list of stakeholders, a long list of partners. It's not about quantity, you know, it's really about being able to identify specific challenges we have and strategically identifying the stakeholder groups or the partner groups that can be champions in helping to fight that challenge. So we, we don't need the long list of stakeholders and everybody is on that list. And yet you find it difficult to see what transformation has taken place. So we, we really need to, to look at that. Uh, but I, I don't want to go on. We, we've had a very long day uh, and I, I really think we've had a very useful uh, deliberation, very useful discussion. Um, I would of course, uh, brief the regional director for Western Central Africa, Dr. Sanginga, on these outcomes. And uh, we are looking forward to getting the report of this meeting, uh, because I think the lessons learned from this meeting, including the very interesting discussion we had towards the end when uh, Dr. Kosari and our other two colleagues who also contributed, I think they are all food for thought not only for Nigeria, but for some of the other countries where we are working also. So with that, I really want to thank IFPRI once again and thank the NPS crew and the team for excellent work. And also to thank the donors who have been behind this work. I know USAID has been putting a lot of money in supporting the IFPRI work. I know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have also been contributing and there are so many other donors uh, without resources. Nothing gets done. So that's my final uh, point, just to say thank you to all of you. And we look forward to working together in this paradigm for agricultural transformation for Nigeria and Africa as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kwesi. I think with this, uh, we come to the end of this event. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please, somebody, someone miss, uh, please the phone charger, in case if you are the owner, just come over to us here to pick it up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>